middle-aged man sat behind the wheel of his car, his eyes fixated on the raindrops dancing on the windshield. Sighing, he turned his gaze towards his reflection in the rearview mirror, taking in his chiseled features, slightly worn with age and experience. There was a subtle air of refinement about him, as though he was no stranger to luxury, but the harsh realities of the world had humbled him. His once jet black hair was now peppered with distinguished streaks of silver. Wary yet piercing blue eyes held a small glimmer of determination, a sparkle declaring that he still had something to prove to the world. His dark suit was immaculate. The satin red tie that encircled his neck slightly loosened after a long day at work. The rain relentlessly pummeled and paved the deserted afternoon streets and the man decided to finally cut the engine. In his haste to exit the vehicle, his opulent leather shoes sank into a puddle of rainwater on one side and dug into a harsh gravel bed on the other. Irritated, he shook off his soaked foot and locked his car, confidently striding towards the door adorned with a flickering neon sign that read, The Twelfth Layer. Pushing open the heavy, creaking door, a musty smell assailed his senses. The bar was shrouded in darkness. A few feeble lamps flickered intermittently, along with typical neon signs that cast an eerie shadows on the peeling walls. The air was heavy with the scent of cigarette smoke and his shoes stuck to the floor, the surface covered in some viscous substance he cared neither to acknowledge nor identify. The ceiling above him sagged in some places, as tired as the patrons of the bar. Grime coated the establishment's windows, making it impossible to see inside or clearly view the world outside. For somewhere meant to be a meeting place, that sensation of isolation within its walls was intense. Despite the warning signs, the man's curiosity shoved them to the back of his mind. The promise of a temporary reprieve from his troubles lured him deeply into the smoky, dank realm. Fully within the belly of the beast, his eyes adapted to the lack of light, and he took notice of the bar's patrons for the first time. They were a motley crew, looking like they'd lived many lives. Something unpleasant prickled at the back of his unconsciousness. A warning he ignored, and he pressed on like a moth inexplicably drawn to a flame. The man slowly lowered himself into the plush cushion of an empty bar stool, feeling the weight of the day bearing down on him. He carefully removed his suit jacket, revealing a dress shirt that was slightly wrinkled. With a heavy sigh, he placed the blazer on the back of the stool, loosened his tie to half-mast, and rolled up his sleeves, revealing the topography of his veins that ran across the back of his forearms. Glancing around the bar again, a voice whispered in his mind that coming here was a mistake and that he should turn back and retreat to the safety of his usual watering hole. A cacophony of insistent whispers overwhelmed and silenced them fast with their sibilance, keeping him rooted to the spot. As the rain continued to pound against the filthy windows and the sound of thunder rumbled in the distance, a bartender appeared behind the counter. Her gaze captured his, her presence effortlessly commanding attention. Dark brown hair fell in loose waves around her face, framing features that were striking in their beauty. Fathomless, almond-shaped eyes drew his gaze, holding him captive with an otherworldly intensity. A neutral smirk graced her full lips, adding to the enigmatic aura that surrounded her. Which unspoken, unfulfilled desire led you to my door? Her words slithered out like a serpent, enticing and dangerous. The man's eyes flickered with momentary confusion, brows furrowed, uncertain how to respond. He quickly shrugged off the oddity of the question and chalked it up to playful banter. His eyes were drawn to her alluring figure, the curve of the bartender's waist as she leaned over the counter of the bar dragging him in like a maelstrom. The form-fitting black dress that she wore accentuated her long, lean limbs and an hourglass figure that could have stopped traffic. From her slender waist to her shapely hips, every curve of her body was in perfect proportion. Smooth, flawless skin, 
The rich honeydew hue of amber glowed in the dim light of the bar. The fabric of her black dress stretched over sensual, imposing curves with every movement. Raw sexuality dripped from her pores, alluring and unsettling. The man found himself captivated by her undeniable beauty, but unnerved by something about her he couldn't quite put his finger on. Pulse pounding, hard in his throat. A mixture of fear and desire coursed through his veins. Studying her intently, alarm bells rang through every fiber of his being. No matter how gorgeous she may have been, he knew something sinister was coiled beneath the pretty surface, poised to strike. He had bigger things to worry about, though, than a beautiful woman. He forced himself to tamp down the sudden emotional turmoil that left him feeling flustered like a teenager. Just a whiskey. Splash of coke. He replied, his voice coarse and exhausted. The bartender's movements were precise, skillful, and practiced as she finished pouring the man's drink. Her every gesture somehow suggestive. With a slow and deliberate push... She slid the glass towards him across the hardwood surface, the liquid inside shimmering in the flickering, inconsistent light. The bartender leaned into his space, and he got a subtle waft of her perfume, the scent stirring a primal desire within him. The heat of her breath on his neck sent a shiver of anticipation down his spine, the sultry tone of her whisper laced with pleasure and danger in equal measures. Here you go. She purred, her words carrying an unspoken promise of something more. A promise to fulfill the darkest, most depraved desires he had lurking in the inky shadows of his subconscious. His mind was clouded, his thoughts swirling in a bottomless void as he gazed from the dangerously low cut of her dress to the amber elixir that sat patiently before him. He felt that the alcohol held a hidden power beckoning him towards an uncertain fate with its irresistible siren song. His eyes fixated on the swirling liquid within as he brought the glass to his lips. Once the amber liquid touched his tongue, it was as if he had been transported to another world. The burn was immediate, and he found himself craving more of the agonizing sensation. The fiery liquid scorched his soul, purging him of all his fears and anxieties. The fiery liquid scorched his soul, purging him of all fears and anxieties, while simultaneously offering a strangely unsettling and intoxicating comfort. The taste lingered on his tongue, filled his senses with a heaty mix of flavors that seemed to swirl and dance before his eyes. The man couldn't help but feel a sense of unease creeping up on him, like he had just stumbled into something forbidden but the allure of the whiskey was too strong to resist, and he took another sip, allowing the burn to spread through him once more, and he felt himself become more and more lost in the dark and mysterious world of this bar. The man finished his first few sips, and the bartender's eyes shimmered with an otherworldly glow. Her movements were fluid and graceful, but in an unnatural way. This is... This is damn good. He said, trying to ignore the strange sensation flowing through him. The bartender returned his compliment with an alluring smile. Her lips curled up subtly. I take pride in my craft, she replied, pouring herself a drink with practiced ease. So, uh, how long you been a bartender? He asked, his voice soft but curious. The bartender's eyes cast downward and darkened for a moment. Her smile faded into a pleasant but blank expression. Long enough, she replied cryptically, her fingers absently tracing the rim of her glass. Why do you ask? The man shrugged, the pangs of unease in his gut growing. Just, um, just curious, I guess. You seem like you've been doing this for a while. The bartender's lips curled into a sly smile, her eyes glittering with a strange light. I've been around the block a few times, she said, her voice low and laced with an almost imperceptible menacing growl. 
But you seem like you're looking for more than just idle conversation. What's really on your mind? The man hesitated, unsure of how to answer. The bartender was probing him, searching for something he wanted to keep hidden beneath the surface. Just, um, life stuff, I guess. He finally muttered, hoping to steer the conversation away from his own troubles. But the bartender wasn't easily deterred. Life stuff can be pretty heavy. She offered sympathy and understanding pouring from her lips, seeking to coax the truth from his tongue, leaving space for him to open up. The man's voice was rough, his words laced with hesitation and doubt. Yeah, but we've all got troubles, you know. I don't want to bore you or take you away from your job, he said, his eyes shifting away from her gaze with some difficulty. The bartender's response was smooth and controlled, her words sliding along his skin like silk. It's just the afternoon crowd. Only a handful of regulars come in at this time of day. They're all busy complaining about the state of the country or retelling the same old story for the 50th time. That leaves me bored and with plenty of time on my hands. She said, that mild, maddening upturn of the corner of her lips audible in her tone. I don't mind sitting and talking with you. After all, that's what I'm here for. To help you feel better in one way or another. The way she spoke was both youthful and ancient, as if she had lived a thousand lifetimes but still retained the innocence of youth. Her voice rippled with secrets and ageless mysteries the man felt no other had bore witness to. He got the sensation that she held all of the answers to his problems, and her animal magnetism held him captive. The bartender's words hung in the air like a cryptic message, coaxing him to spill his secrets in inner turmoil. His mind raced with the implications that dripped from her tone, but he dared not let his thoughts wander too far down that path. The way she looked at him did have him intrigued, but the gleam of something dangerous in her eyes made him equally uneasy. The sound of ice clinking against glasses filled the air as the bartender mixed another drink snapping the man back to the present moment. I've been in this line of work for quite some time now. She began, her words soft but low and velvety, a stark contrast to the raucous sounds of the bar. But I've come to learn that people don't just come here for the drinks. The man was taken aback by her statement, unsure of what she meant. As he watched her step out from behind the bar, he noticed how she moved with an effortless predatory grace, as if she were gliding across the floor. When she sat down beside him, he felt a chill run down his spine. He tried to brush off the feeling of unease and maintain his composure, but as she continued to speak, he felt out of sorts, like the bartender didn't belong. I don't think anyone gets into slinging drinks if they don't have a touch of therapist in their personality. This may seem like just another dingy dive bar to most, but it has a way of making you feel comfortable, of giving you exactly what you desire. She said, her voice almost a whisper as she took a slow sip of her drink and lit a cigarette. As the lighter sparked to life, the man's attention was drawn to the bartender's eyes. At first, they appeared wholly pitch black as a starless night sky, but as the flame flickered out, they returned to their natural deep brown hue. The man stared transfixed for a moment, wondering if what he had seen was real or just a trick of the light. Unable to come to a conclusion, He pushed the thought aside and focused on the bartender's words as she spoke again. Michael, tell me, what is it that you desire most? A fresh start, perhaps. 
Her question hung in the smoky air, thick with the same seductive undertone that had permeated their entire conversation. Michael's mind raced as he tried to rationalize the bartender's ability to know his name when he had not offered it to her. There's no way that she knew it, he thought, skepticism taking over and spiking fear as it jolted through him. It's gotta be a lucky guess, I mean, she maybe saw it on my credit card when I handed it over. There was something else going on, some secret game he wasn't privy to, but he tried to convince himself that it was just his imagination. Quickly scanning over the other patrons, he noticed that they all seemed to be caught up in their own worlds, oblivious to the bartender's charms. Maybe this is just a typical server con, he thought to himself, reassuring himself that he wasn't falling for her manipulation. She just hopes I'll leave her a nice tip, that's all. His instincts told him that there was something more to the bartender's motives, and he wasn't sure how much longer he could push that sensation aside. Michael's next words hung heavy with a thick and palpable sense of longing and melancholy. Don't we all harbor secret desires? A desire to hit the reset button, miss? He trailed off, his overly eager gaze fixed on the bartender with a wistful yearning. Lily, she replied, her voice carrying an enigmatic depth that belied the callousness of her tone. It's true. We all long for a chance to wipe the slate clean, to start anew, but would you really let the devil take the lead in that dance? As she spoke, the hair on the back of his neck stood on end with a sense of foreboding. Taking a deep breath to steady himself, Michael began to speak, his words constricted and thick with emotion. My life is, uh, my life is unraveling, he confessed, his hands gripping the glass so tightly that his knuckles turned white. My wife is leaving me and I feel like I'm losing grip on everything. My kids, they're distant and angry with me for reasons that I cannot fathom. And the worst part is... I did everything right. I followed the script that society gave me, checked all the boxes of what it means to be successful. I worked hard, climbed the corporate ladder, and now I'm the head of my department. I give my family everything they could ever need. A beautiful home, the best schools, and all the material things money could buy. Sure, I'm not the best husband or father of the year but I do my damnedest to provide for them. And I thought that was enough. But it isn't. None of it is. Now I feel like I'm left with nothing. Like I've been abandoned by those closest to me. Hell, by even God himself. As he spoke, the air around him grew heavy with an ominous energy. The clinking of glasses and murmur of conversation faded into the ether. A veil had been lifted, revealing the dark underbelly of the facade that Michael had so carefully constructed. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air, leaving behind a tangible feeling of discomfort. Michael's thoughts were in turmoil as he grappled with the weight of his troubles. Sensing his unease, Lily drew closer to him. Dark eyes locked his with unwavering intensity. A hint of apprehension fought to break her hold on him, but her alluring voice, smooth as butter, compelled him to listen only to her. Her hands settled on his thigh with a gentle warmth. You're feeling lost, Michael, but you have nothing to fear. It's all right to let go. He gazed into the depths of her eyes, idly thinking he'd be content to drown in them. You have a great deal of untapped potential. So many valuable things you can still contribute. What you need is someone who sincerely supports your desires. 
and can help you find the path you're meant to travel on, Michael. I can help you break the hold your past has on you, so you can move into your destined future. Michael's body tensed, his mind struggling to wrap around the meaning behind her words. He couldn't deny that he was attracted to Lily. Yet, as he cast his gaze downwards towards his banded finger, clasping the glass, he was reminded of his wife that he still loved. She had willingly walked away from him in all their years together, but he was hesitant to cast her out of his heart. She was the love of his life, the mother of his children. Yet, as fleeting as these contemplations infiltrated his subconscious, a contrasting inner monologue chastised him, growing in volume and confidence. The voice resonated with ominous authority, serving as a stark reminder to Michael that it was his wife who had willingly abandoned the sanctity of their home. It was she who had brought their relationship to a close. Michael, she hates you. You deserve to be with someone who will fulfill your soul's deepest desire. Lily leaned in closer, the heat from her nearness thrumming along his skin. I know that this is not an easy decision for you, Michael. But sometimes we must let go of that which no longer serves us in order to grow and evolve. You deserve to be with someone who will fulfill your deepest desires and help you become the best version of yourself. Who are you? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. A smile crept into Lily's face, and her lips curled into a mischievous, toothy grin that chilled Michael to the marrow of his bones. A friend, with your best interests at heart. She replied, the grimace fading back to a relaxing smile so fast he wondered if he had imagined it. Someone who understands what you're going through. A woman who understands the depths of your pain and wants to help you get through it. Michael stared at her, disbelief and confusion wearing for control of his expression. Her words echoed through his head as he tried to make sense of the situation. How could she possibly understand his pain and struggles? What could she possibly offer him that he didn't already have? He had only just met her, yet she spoke like she'd known him intimately for years. Michael's bright blue gaze remained fixed on Lily's, his eyes searching for any hint of deception, but finding none. With a deep breath, Michael finally spoke. <sighs> okay. He began, his voice thready and unsure. What do I need to do? Lily's full lips spread to flash a hint of perfect white teeth as her grin widened. Her hand slid slightly higher up his thigh as she leaned her weight more fully upon it. Put your trust in me, Michael. Trust that I know what's best for you. I can guide you to where you need to be, if you allow it. And in return, I promise you'll be granted everything you've been searching for. The things your soul has been crying out for, if only you would listen to its desperate Leading. Michael's heartbeat stuttered as he pondered her words. Should he really trust this woman? What did she want from him? What would she get out of this? Questions swirled in the circle drain of his mind, disappearing finally under a wave of mixed excitement and apprehension. Giving his thigh squeeze through his slacks, her breath was warm on his cheek. While his voice was laced with heat as she asked, you're ready for a refill, aren't you? 
and pushing the glass that she was holding towards him. I already have a... Michael gazed down in bewilderment as he came to the realization that his glass was indeed empty. It appeared to have been sitting vacant for so long that the ice had melted. Michael was perplexed. He couldn't remember drinking more than a few sips from the glass, which he was certain had been full only a short while ago. As he raised the fresh glass provided by Lily to his mouth, he observed that the liquid was transparent, but had both a bluish tint and a delicate aroma. Initially, he detected a subtle fragrance of lilies, which he found ironic, but then he was hit with an unmistakable cloying odor of gasoline, reminiscent of a motorcycle on a hot summer day. Michael lifted the glass to his lips, hesitant for a moment before taking a long swallow. As the liquid followed down his gullet, he was hit with an intense rush of pleasure that was both fire and ice in every cell of his body. His entire being quivered with pleasure, and it was as if he had never been overwhelmed with the most soul-shattering climax of his life. Never before had he felt the total sensation of being whole, satiated, utterly, and unabashedly content. After a few short moments, the sensation began to fade, and Michael was hit with a wave of despair that washed over him. It was a feeling of profound emptiness, as if something precious had been taken from him that he could never get back. He tried to shake it off, but the desolate feeling lingered, clinging to him like a shadow. Lily took a drag. The cherry of the cigarette glowing brightly before the cherry of the cigarette glowing brightly before she exhaled the smoke directly in his face. Coughing and waving the cloud away, Michael's emotions dissipated, leaving him confused and disoriented. It felt like Lily's smoke had the power to control his emotions, to manipulate his innermost desires and fears. Michael leaned back on his stool feeling violated, powerless and unable to explain what the hell had just happened. In that moment, Michael considered leaving the rest of the drink untouched and walking off, leaving the bar and driving away from this whole odd experience. The memory of the intense pleasure he had just experienced was too enticing, and he found himself taking another sip, and then another. As he drank, Michael felt himself slipping further and further into a world of darkness and uncertainty. A world where pleasure and pain were two sides of the same coin, and where neither was as it seemed. Michael was lost in a haze of emotions that seemed to stretch on for years. His mind was consumed with sensations of ecstasy and dread, pleasure and pain. He felt trapped in a never-ending dream, unable to escape. As suddenly as it had started, Lily blew another puff of smoke into his face, and Michael was yanked back to a sobering reality. The world around him snapped back into focus, and he realized with a jolt how long he had been lost in his own mind. He looked at Lily, and he was overcome with fear and mistrust. Michael's mind felt fried and crispy, while also pliable and shapeless like gelatin. He had just experienced a time distortion that defined explanation. How long had his thoughts held him prisoner? Several hours? Days? He scanned the bar, studying every person's face, looking for some clue, some indication of what had happened. That someone else had experienced the anomaly too. But there was nothing unusual or otherworldly about them. Every person that was there prior to his fall down the rabbit hole was still present. Thoughts racing, Michael tried to make sense of what he had just gone through. He felt like he had been inside a dream, but the vividness and intensity of the emotions he had experienced were unlike anything he had ever felt before. Hastily pulling out his phone from his pocket, he discovered that the time was 3.57 p.m., as he replayed the events in his head, he recalled glancing at the time on his car's dashboard when he arrived, which read 3.29pm. That meant 
that a mere 28 minutes had elapsed since he first stepped foot inside the 12th layer. How is that possible? He murmured. Michael, what you just experienced is completely natural. She began, her voice low and sultry. Her words were calm and reassuring, like he was a wild animal about to bolt if he couldn't be brought to heel. This depth of emotion is something you've been searching for your entire life. Even if you couldn't put a name to it before. And I can make sure you never have to stop feeling that all-encompassing ecstasy. Michael stared at her in disbelief, struggling to comprehend what she was saying with his fried and jellied gray matter. What do you mean? He hated the way that his voice trembled, but he needed answers. I'm showing you everything you've ever wanted, Michael. Everything you could want to fill the aching emptiness in your heart. But there's still more I can offer you. She murmured. As Michael let Lily's words sink in, a peculiar feeling that was a cross between dread and exhilaration washed over him. His curiosity was piqued, and he'd never experienced anything like this before. He might not get another opportunity and was afraid to waste this one. What more can you offer me? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Ellie took another drag from her cigarette. Her lips curled around it suggestively as she inhaled deeply. You'll have to come with me to find out, she said with a wink, her tone cryptic, her eyes glittering with an emotion he couldn't pinpoint as she continued. That is what you desire, right? What you've been longing for? Fulfillment? Acknowledgement? Satisfaction? Yes. Michael's response was immediate and impulsive, driven by a powerful wave of desire. At that moment, he couldn't recall anything about his mundane life. His responsibilities, his wife, and his children were pushed to the back of his mind. All he could think about was Lily. Her presence was addictive, a forbidden temptation that consumed his thoughts and his sensations. Without her, he felt incomplete, as though he would surely wither away into nothingness. The desire to be with her consumed him. He wanted everything she had, everything she was offering, and that still didn't feel like enough. Lily's hands held the key to a new world, a world that he never could have dreamed of. Michael was captivated by her. He knew that he would follow her to the ends of the earth and beyond, even if it meant losing himself completely. Michael's heart thudded in his chest as he held Lily closer, hands pressing to the small of her back, his lips near enough to hers that he ached for a taste. But just as he was about to lose herself in her kissable mouth, she suddenly retreated, leaving him bewildered and vexed. Without a word, Lily gracefully hopped off her bar stool and offered Michael her upturned hand. He stared at it, fascinated and uncertain, until her fingers wiggled enticingly and he slid his fingers between hers. Not missing a beat, her grip tightened on his, and she led him towards a crimson door situated at the back of the dimly lit bar, an entrance that he failed to notice before. As they weaved their way through the crowd of patrons, Michael's senses fixed on the roughness of Lily's hand. Her palm and fingers were lined with well-worn calluses, giving him the impression that she had spent countless years engaging in hard labor. It wasn't unpleasant but it was difficult to ignore the coarse calluses sliding against the smoothness of his own skin. As they walked, Michael's gaze lingered on the other customers. Initially, 
They appeared as ordinary as any person one might expect to see in a bar. But the longer he observed them, the more wrong they appeared. They were silent. Not a single sound came from them, despite their mouths moving and their hands gesturing animatedly. He peered into their eyes and noticed that they were a deep, glossy black, devoid of any semblance of life or warmth. Even their sclera were filled with inky emptiness. The skin of their faces appeared worn and aged, sunken and shallow like they were wearing old latex Halloween masks. Due to the dim lighting and distance from them, he hadn't noticed those details until he'd gotten closer to them. Insides rolling with disgust, Michael genuinely wanted to leave. As they finally reached the red door, Lily paused and turned to face him like she could sense his apprehension. Leaning her back against the door, she gazed up at him with her mesmerizing large dark eyes. Her pouty lips were inviting, and her words echoed that invitation, her pose open and welcoming. Don't be afraid, Michael. These people are seekers, just like you and me, searching for something more. No need to be shy. You don't strike me as the type to leave a lady wanting. She opened the heavy door and he followed her through the aperture, the latch shutting behind them with a sense of finality that made his blood run cold. Swallowing audibly, Michael shook his head, a measure of his confidence returning. He certainly was not. Their footsteps echoed in the stone hallway, passing closed doors on either side. Fluorescent lights stuttered where they hung from chains on the industrial ceiling. Michael knew that this hallway went further than the length of the bar should have allowed for, but glancing down and watching the sachet of Lily's hips as her stiletto heels clacked on the concrete floor, his concern dissipated quickly. How long had it taken them to reach the door at the end of the hallway? How many doors had they bypassed on their way there? The answers hovered at the edge of his consciousness. They hovered, just out of reach. Too unimportant for him to grab and make them tangible. A symbol perched just above the doorknob, a simple icon of two black wings. Lily lifted their joined hands pressed his palm against the symbol. Gazing up at Michael, a devilish chuckle rolled from Lily's lips as she noticed the falter in his steps. She gazed up at him under dark lashes, dragging the corners of her full lower lip between her teeth, then pulling him into the room with her. It could have been any other bedroom. The flickering candles filled the air with the heaty scent of lilies and a strange sensation of heat that prickled along his skin. Windowless, the air would have been stale if it weren't for the multitude of small flames that made the plain walls dance with shadows. Nah. -uh. Lily cooed, grabbing his face in her hands and giving him the kiss that he'd been craving earlier. Her hands slid to tangle in his hair crushing her lips to his with a fervor that was unexpected. No running off in that brain of yours, Michael. You're here now with me. Her words were borderline breathless, hovering just over his mouth. Wrapping his red tie around her fist, she used it like a leash to lead him to the bed that beckoned them from the center of the room. Her fingers deftly undered the buttons of his rumpled dress shirt, hands slipping beneath the fabric to glide across his chest and down his torso, with a reverence that gave Michael pause. He was in decent shape, but he wasn't a young man anymore. For such a gorgeous woman to be so pleased merely from touching him made him feel seen in a way that he hadn't in years, decades even. Intimacy with his wife had petered off to nothing years ago. His wife. Head empty, Michael. No other thoughts. Focus 
on me. Focus on us. Give me everything, Michael. The good, the bad, the depraved. I want all of you. Anything you've been afraid to release before, those are the things I need. I promise there's nothing in that pretty silvered head of yours that would scare me off. But you're going to have to bring your A-game. They dressed in comfortable quiet, and he noticed how strange it was that there was no mirror in the room, no reflective surfaces at all, now that he was paying attention anyway. It was odd, but he felt detached from the curiosity like he was floating above his body rather than residing within it. Lily was practically glowing, her cheeks flushed with good health as she paused to kiss him deeply. Thank you, Michael, for giving me everything. I hope you found what you were looking for. Suddenly exhausted and weary, he nodded and let her lead him back into the bar proper. As their hands parted, she took her place behind the bar, that orange gleam in her eyes once more. Lily was definitely more chipper, from the bounce in her step to the smile on her face. It was undeniable. Take care, Michael, she said with an ecstatic wave. He lifted his hand half-heartedly as he plodded outside, the last remaining sounds of the bar stopping dead as the door slammed behind him. Not only had the sounds of the bar cut off, but the rain that he expected to meet his weary face had ceased. Instead of the peaking and overcast sun, the sky was gray and the world eerily silent. Everything around him was just so... different. Not just different, no. It was wrong. The surrounding buildings were boarded up. Trash littered the streets and weeds now grew tall from the cracked asphalt on the parking lot. The whole neighborhood seemed to have fallen apart in the few hours he'd spent at the bar and in its back room. With Lily... This view should have affected him more than it did, but Michael suddenly felt very wary, even more so after parting ways with Lily, as his back suddenly began to be in pain, a new pain Michael was not accustomed to. In his exhaustion, his soul took precedence and he took determined, slow, shuffling steps until he reached his vehicle. His once gorgeous luxury car was now covered in rust and grime as if it hadn't been touched in decades. He sank into the driver's seat with a groan, his lower back protesting the movement. The car seat itself was encased in dust, a relic from another era. Knobby fingers trembling as he truly looked at them. Michael raised his hand to adjust the mirror, getting a glimpse of his visage in the reflection. His heart pounding in his chest as he gazed at his reflection in the rearview mirror. The face staring back at him was weathered, his skin sagging, age spots peppering his previously firm flesh. His hair was all silvery gray now, what remained of it anyway. He'd aged. He was now an old man, a stranger to himself and a shiver of fear coursed through his varicose veins. How could this have happened? How had he become the old man who appeared to be on death's door in the span of only a few hours? Michael strained to look more closely through the front window shield. Not only did a heavy layer of dirt make this difficult, but his once 2020 vision now appeared to have become more severely impaired. With some difficulty, he was finally able to focus his attention on the desolate surroundings. Once lively and vibrant, the bar was now a decrepit shell of its former self. In fact, there was no shell. 
An empty lot now struck Michael as he leaned even closer, not believing his eyes. His hand slipped on the wheel as he leaned in, causing Michael to hit the horn and accidentally startle himself, making his heart pound so hard that he felt a heart attack would take him then and there. Whoops. A voice cooed from the back seat. He knew that voice. A voice that haunted. A voice that ensnared. A voice whose sound pierced Michael's eardrums and caused the back of his neck to suddenly begin to sweat. Michael quickly adjusted the rearview mirror. He aimed its reflection at the back seat, hoping and praying to God that she would not be there. Yet, there she was. Legs crossed. One arm laying across her stomach while supporting her other arm as it sat upright and playing with her hair. A soft smile spread across her pouty lips. She was just as he remembered her. Yet those eyes of hers. They were different now. Michael once again strained at the reflection he saw in the mirror, only to gasp as he realized that her eyes were no longer human. Humanoid still, yes, but her unsettling pupils now resembled those of a goat. What? What are you? Michael's shaky voice clawed its way from the depths of his soul, rough and ragged like the edge of a rusty blade. Suspense hung heavy in the air, as though time itself had an anticipatory breath, eagerly awaiting her response and dreading it all at the same time. Her fingers, which had been twining through her silky hair, halted mid-motion, her once piercing and alluring eyes shifted in that suspended moment, shedding the aura of malevolence for a fleeting trace of sorrow. Arms crossed defensively over her chest. Her gaze dropped, tracing the path of a tear that had traversed her cheek. Like a drifting specter, her eyes meandered towards the side window, as if seeking solace in the darkness outside. After that pause, in a cadence that matched the rhythm of a heavy heart, Lily began to speak. The words rolled from her lips a slow and mournful melody that seemed to echo not only in the car, but in the very air itself. Michael felt her words reverberate in the marrow of his bones. They dub me first wife. They cry owl in the night. Bloodsucker, life's leech in dim lunar light. Ostrich's haunt, Jackal's dwelling, am I. My tree, a tangle of dreams neath the sky. With apples of longing, my boughs they adorn. Desire's secret whispers, erotic and worn. I allure men with webs, spun silken and bright. Entrapping, their gazes ensnaring their sight. My tongue is a charm like a serpent's soft hiss, its silver deceit a beguiling abyss. Ho oh, Lilith, they ask, is he lost to your wake? Has that youth met your eyes, his heart did partake? Like tendrils of darkness, the words wound their ways into the car's confines, embracing the eerie atmosphere that hung to every surface. Soft drops of rain began to fall on the exterior of the car as she spoke again, wiping away the tear that had streaked across her cheek. But to you, I'm just your bartender, Lily. She chimed her voice resounding through the car's quiet with an eerie melody. Her words carried a faint yet deliberate lilt, her body jolting ever so slightly as if seeking to rouse herself from an otherworldly reverie. Those enigmatic eyes fixed on Michael, her gaze reflected back in the rearview mirror, a twinkle of something ethereal glistening within. His voice trembled. 
a frail whisper in the presence of the uncanny, as he implored for answers. I don't understand. What have you done to me? To the world? The question hung between them, a thread woven from confusion and desperation, seeking to unravel the web of inexplicable occurrences. Once bewitching and enigmatic, Lily's eyes met his gaze, a fleeting connection in the mirror image. Her answer unraveled like tendrils of smoke, carrying a mixture of certainty and cryptic revelation. Well, the world remains as it should be, untouched by my hand. But you, my dear, I've given you precisely what you craved. Silence evoked the car's interior, a sanctuary for the raindrops that now cascaded upon its metal skin. Tapping out an enigmatic melody, the streetlights outside flickered hesitantly, casting shadows that danced in rhythm with the storm. Lily's voice, a haunting undercut in the tempest, continued its seductive dance, a narrative woven from strands of shared desire and secret yearnings. Remember, you spoke of your world unraveling, the emptiness that gnawed at you, the feeling of being abandoned by everything you held dear. You longed for a different path, a fresh future. And so, when I offered you that chance, you agreed. Didn't you, Michael? The rain outside surged, a torrent that cleansed the car's exterior of its accumulated grime, leaving streaks of clarity on the windows. Michael turned his gaze to the newfound transparency beyond the glass, a mirror to his awakening comprehension. The taste of the drinks lingered on his lips, like the imprint of a story he was only just starting to remember. He brought his hands to his face, his fingers pressed against his temples as he inhaled a deep breath. The drinks. They had been the catalyst, the vessels that ferried him through a spectrum of emotions, a lifetime condensed into a few fleeting hours. Yet, that still didn't explain why he was old. Lily's voice whispered in the space beside him. A sudden intrusion into his thoughts. His hands dropped from his face, his eyes shooting open, meaning hers just inches away. She sat beside him, her delicate hands perched upon her, her chin resting atop them. Those eyes, once captivating, now held in unfathomably intensity, a darkness that threatened to consume his very being. Fear clotted him. A desperate instinct to look away, to escape her unnerving stare. But his gaze remained locked, shackled by an unseen force, ensnared in its unrelenting grip. The rain outside drummed its chaotic rhythm, a symphony of dread and revelation. Michael's mind churned, grappling with the terrors that had begun to take shape. You're wondering why you're old now. Lily's words hung in the air, a blend of playful curiosity and eerie anticipation, wrapping Michael in their unsettling embrace. The question clung to the edges of his consciousness, like a ghostly echo that refused to dissipate. He managed a feeble. Yes. His voice was a reedy tremor as he remained bound by the unyielding grip of her eyes, those eyes like windows to a realm of uncanny dread. Her movement was both graceful and sinister. Her head lifted from his shoulder, her lithe form shifted until she nestled in his lap, arms coiling like serpents around his neck and shoulders. A chill slithered down his spine as her proximity became an intimate envision, a presence seeping into every fiber of his being. You needed to pay. For your tab. She purred, her voice an intoxicating blend of allure and malevolence. A tremor coursed through him, causing his already loose clothes to hang even looser. 
his breath hitched in his chest, his heartbeat, once a rhythm of life, now slowed to an eerie cadence. A disconcerting throb echoed in his ears. Lily's voice drew closer, her lips a mere breath away, her words riding a sulfurous exhalation that seemed to coil around him like a vice. You asked how long I've been doing this, and I told you that it's been a while. Her words oozed. After the first millennia or two, you really start to lose count. Her lips brushed the precipice of his own with a humorous chuckle. The sensation of decay and sulfur tainted the very air he breathed. To maintain my enticing facade, my captivating appearance. He clung to every word, prisoned by them as easily as he had been by her serpentine gaze. I devour the souls of men like you, broken, yearning souls, the perfect fountain of youth. I offer you a lifetime's worth of experiences, emotions, and in return... Her words trail off hanging like the whispered promise of oblivion. Lily's fingers thrust his head aside, a swift and unyielding motion that directed his gaze towards the rain-soaked window. The world was beyond shifted, transformed before his eyes. The life, the bustling energy, the reassuring presence of humanity, it was all there. Restored as if the apocalypse had been naught but a fever dream, Streetlights gleamed, offices were lit, and the rain painted the world anew. It was normalcy reborn, a snapshot of reality reclaimed from the precipice of chaos. With another forceful thrust, Lily returned his gaze to her. And now, she had metamorphosized into a grotesque parody of the enchanting figure he had met. Her skin, once alluring and smooth, now bore the scars of hellfire, mangled and bloodied. The horns of a beast that never walked the earth curved from the sides of her head, hair a tangled, matted mess. The elegant dress was reduced to tatters, and the legs that he had once gladly died for were replaced by grotesque, clawed appendages. Fingers twisted into razor-sharp talons, and her once pearly teeth now protruded, yellowed, and fanged. But you, Michael... Her voice shifted, dropping into a low, demonic register. You are not like the others. They were a fulfilling meal, to be sure. But your essence, your taste... Is exceptional. So broken, so defeated, so hopeless. He saw a spark of what could only be described as hellfire in her eyes as the last words escaped her lips, dripping with ecstasy. I must consume every drop of you, Michael. Every last ounce of your life force must be wrung from you until you are bone dry. This delightful game has kept my interest longer than most, and I did so enjoy your enthusiasm. But alas, my hunger waits for no man. It's time to pay the rest of your tab. Her proximity became stifling. Her lips drew closer to his in a perverse parody of intimacy. The final moment hung suspended in the charged atmosphere, his vision narrowing as her lips, the harbingers of both pleasure and pain, descended upon his. In the last heartbeat, he felt a searing agony, an overwhelming darkness 
And then... Oblivion. The shadows embraced him, and his consciousness slipped into the abyss, swallowed by Lily's ravenous hunger. The radio's crackled voice sweeped through the silence of the squad car, a thread of information that wove itself into Officer Schultz's thoughts as he guided his vehicle into the bar's desolate parking lot. Be advised, we have reports of a missing male, Michael Emerson, 41. Date of birth, July 31st, 1987. Last seen at the 12th Later Bar in Santa Clara. Vehicle is a 1957 Ford Fairline 500 Skyliner. The radio intoned. The words danced through the quiet night air. Officer Schultz put the squad car into park, his gaze sweeping over the vacant lot, a barren expanse devoid of life. An eerie emptiness hung over the scene, punctuated only by the faint glow filtering through the bar's somber windows and the sporadic flickering of the neon sign. The sensation that the bar was closed would have gripped him if not for the tantalizing gleam that hinted at life lurking within. Raindrops cascaded from the heavens, a sudden downpour that drenched the world in liquid silver. With a sigh that mirrored the heavens' discontent, Officer Schultz shifted his focus from the heavens to the earth beneath his feet, only to feel the wet intrusion of his leather boots sinking into an unruly puddle. Son of a bitch, he muttered in irritation, the expletive rolling off his tongue like a refrain he was all too familiar with. Something I can help you with, officer. A silken voice dripped with all over, and something far more sinister, slithering from the safety of the bar's overhang. A puff of smoke followed the voice, a curling wisp that mingled with the rain-soaked atmosphere. Officer Schultz's gaze ascended to focus on a visage that set his pulse racing and his heart senses tingling. The attractive woman with raven dark hair fixed him with a gaze that seemed to hold secrets just beneath its surface. He found himself momentarily lost in the curves of her figure in the alluring cut of her black dress, but he rustled his focus back to the task at hand. firm and unwavering, strictly professional. The woman's lips curved into a sly smile, a tease that suggested the depths of her knowledge were as intoxicating as her appearance. With a casual motion, she discarded her cigarette, extinguishing its ember under the heel of her shoe. Her gaze swept over him from head to toe in a way that was almost palpable, a chill running down his spine that he elected to ignore. Hmm. She mused, the sound of a purr that wove between the raindrops with the skill of a prowling predator, piercing their intended target. Why don't you come in from the rain, Officer Schultz? I'll see what I can do. To help you out. Three weeks ago, I killed my girlfriend, Melanie Palmer. Chopped her body into 11 pieces and buried them in scattered, discreet locations around my state. This isn't a confession. Well, I guess it is. But that's not the driving force behind this admission. I don't expect any empathy. Or any guidance. I don't even expect anyone to take this seriously. Me? All the prerequisites have been said. Though I suppose it wouldn't hurt to give you a rundown. I'm not what you'd call striking. Though I've always made it a point to blend and flow with society. To delicately veneer my true nature with a cordial persona, however contrived. Maybe we've met before. Probably not. If we have, good luck pegging a name on me. Or, for
for that matter, finding me at all. Melanie wasn't my first victim. It's just that all the others were animals from all different clads. Fish, birds, mammals, reptiles. It's fascinating how each organism reacts in their own way. You see, our brains contained mirror neurons... They're responsible for the pity you feel when a wounded dog comes whimpering by your heel, and for the lack of it when a creature expresses pain in a manner that you're unused to. Honestly, it's fucking shallow, but it's the human condition. Except, I'm human, and I'd like to say I'm past all that sickly sweet bullshit. And let's be honest, feelings are a hindrance more than not. So the trustworthy thing to do is observe. I mentioned dogs already. They always end up being a right mess. Screaming and writhing, contorting their limbs as if the thumbtacks in their eyes are going to kill them. The idea of having kids has always been off-putting to me. Dealing with an indignant mutt is just as tedious. Chickens fuss a bit then sort of freeze up once they realize flight isn't an option. Pun intended. <laughs> the first few times it's funny. But it gets old. I can go on. If it makes you feel any better, call me a coward. Take all the jabs you want. The fact is that I haven't killed people. Well, until now. Just offers a cheap avenue for insult. Even when the rational part of your brain is relieved, I stuck to animals. There's no tangible strings of influence that I have over anything anymore. So if nothing else, be sincere. Mourn the dead. And for your information, I say this not out of empathy. Nothing bores me more than loafing around. Don't stew in resentment. Get on with your damn lives. Okay, now that all that is clear, I can get into why I'm even writing this. Five days went by without a hitch, and that's when I started seeing it. Nothing intrusive at first. I'd spy a figure in the distance, swaying gently as need shimmered in the wind. The first time, it was nothing but a fleeting curiosity. The second time, however, it lodged inside my brain like thorns in a boot sole. An old man told me once, A house can be haunted, but so can we. I know he was referring to memories, trauma, regret, but I don't carry those burdens. Maybe the universe sought to level the playing field, I don't know. I see the figure everywhere now half obscured at the end of a grocery store aisle, standing on an overpass while I'm driving along the highway, sometimes in places that make no sense, physically speaking, like behind the stove extractor fan, small as if distant yet contained in such a tiny space. By itself, not so scary of course, I wouldn't be here if things didn't worsen. When I stare at the thing, my head starts to pound. A static thrumming in my ears. Feels like everything else starts to crumble away. Except the figure. It grows clearer the longer I gaze into its rippling silhouette. Let me tell you, nothing scares me. Not really. As long as I still have my agency... But whenever I notice it, swaying against the ashen sky, it's as if something outside of myself is sticking toothpicks between my eyelids, leather straps around my limbs, holding me in place only to stare at the loose segments rippling with the haze of a mirage and swaying of kelp. And the more I watch, and the less my thoughts wander, it approaches. I never see it moving, but it gets closer sharper. A few days ago, it got close enough for me to truly make out its body. I was correct about it being in segments, but only now could I count them. Eleven. 
eleven ragged pieces strung by glistening sinew and entrails. It'd be so easy to say that she'd come back to me, from the grave and all of that. Yet somehow I can tell that that's only half truth. Because when Melanie was close enough to fix me with her murky eyes, I noticed the thing behind her. Taut, gray skin, mottled by mangy tufts of hair. Those are the only consistently visible features. I can't help but feel she's picked up an errant companion somewhere between death and, well, whatever's after, if anything. Or maybe it found her. Either way, it's here now and I'm powerless to fight back. It can't be some form of post-mortem vengeance. Otherwise, why would it drive its blackened and chipped nails up into Melanie's exposed organs, twisting gargled screams out of her like some macabre conductor? Why would it coil and squeeze its phlegmy, splitting tongues through her nose and ears and mouth? All the while it fixes me with a glare through the gap of her neck, flat shark-like eyes somehow conveying a perversion so fast past my own it sickens me. I really don't know what it wants. For me, it feels like all those little animals did. Possibly. Although that feels a bit facile when I see them look in its eyes. I realized it wasn't Melanie herself wavering in the air after I saw the things torn in ancient rags drifting lazily around her sides as though underwater. From where the world faded, slowly, things just vanished. Number 17 across the street was replaced by monotone ground, a lumpy rock plain. And so it went for everything else. The looming forest hills to the east, gone. The main road leading out of town, gone. The entire industrial estate a couple of streets over. You get the picture. Just barren stone in place of what once was. The fear stagnant at first, then bubbled up with a needling ferocity. It started to become too much. My van was gone and I dared not leave the confines of my home. Though at this point it was more of a prison than a sort of comfortable retreat. I caught a few mice in the pantry and made some crosses out of popsicle sticks. Crucified them. Got bored waiting for them to croak. So I ended up dunking them in a pot of boiling water till they stopped moving. In the past, something like that would have evened me out. But now, those lifeless eyes bore into the back of my neck whenever I look away. The feeling is inescapable. The sound of its wet, guttural rumbling is insufferable. I wish that I'd just get it over with. Tear my eyes out. Hang me from my own intestines. I don't care. Everything else is gone now, other than my house. The windows offer a view out across an indeterminable plain. The sky is filled with dull clouds so that the horizon is practically invisible blending seamlessly with stone. Shit. I just looked up for my laptop and even the house is gone. All at the mercy of this fucking thing that won't even show itself to me. Hiding behind my greatest sin. Clacking teeth and all. Bony mantis limbs unfolding. Eyes reflecting the deepest, coldest ocean. The depth of their cruelty is immeasurable. It's standing right in front of me, still holding up the mangled body shield of Melanie, still flaying her skin and unsheathing her bone. I'd actually respect the monster's depravity if I weren't its prisoner. As I record this, I can see its drumming fingers in the corner of my eye. Is it impatient? Why is it even letting me type? I think it wants me to cast out my message in a bottle so it can be lost to the waves. I know no one will ever read it. 
though if anyone does, I doubt they'd spare any empathy to seek me out. To that I say, fair enough. I'm a lot of things, but a hypocrite I am not. Haven't felt hungry in a while, or thirsty. I don't even feel tired and I've been awake for what, a week? Maybe two? I resigned to this fate, so I tried smashing my head into the ground over and over, desperate to end this nightmare. All it's done is given me a splitting headache, not a drop of blood, and is laughing now. That's all I can equate its hacking rasps to. I can smell its breath polluting the air, old blood and scorched bone with the heat to match. Melanie screaming too, with whatever's left of her vocal cord. The disgusting sympathy rattles inside my skull. It's the worst sound that I've ever heard. I just looked up again and it's gone. Melanie's still there, weightless though her eyes are that of the monsters. Sunless discs excluding venom slicked malice so heavily it's palpable. I lost my router connection a while back, but had enough sense to make a SIM out of my phone and put it in the laptop. Mobile data still works, though I don't understand the logic dictating that. Fuck. I hope this isn't eternity. My mind's already broken once, but something fixed it up good is new, just to be crushed by the torment once more. The screeching, it's so loud. Maniacal cackles, torturing wails. They already sound the same to me. It's not fair. What other psychotic piece of shit like me has been sentenced to something like this? People whose boundless savagery makes me look like a law-abiding citizen where all they got were life or death sentences. It isn't fair. My body's frozen stiff, from terror or some unseen force. It's impossible to tell. I can feel the moist waves of its stinking breath on my neck. Stop it. Please. It isn't fair. Is that what she thinks? I can't... what? I didn't write that. I want to click post right now, it's just, it's just fucking ironic. In these last moments, I'll ever have a connection to anyone anywhere else. The words are lost on me. Say, Melanie, what do you think? The way its fingers unfold in my peripheral, like a massive spider uncurling its legs, my spine's itching. She thinks you've said enough. My thoughts exactly. Why? Why are you tainting my last words? It's not fair. This isn't fair. No, but it is. Now you can be with her. Never again lonely. Fingers. Fingers creeping across my eyes. Peeling dry skin. It crackles and crunches by my ear, one extending with so many joints. So many. So loud. Like gunfire. Ears hurt. Look. She's waiting for you. Melanie hangs festering before me. Her legs sway limply, toes grazing smooth stone. I never thought a sight could make a person so nauseous. Go fall into her arms and drown with her. Drown in the sweet song of your sin for all of time. Arms. Her arms. In pieces. Broken. Violated. I only meant to. Come on now. Well, what else is there to do? 
I have to go. She's waiting in some form or another. To my friends and... No. It doesn't matter. Each and every one of us will be forgotten, given time. God knows, I've been given more than enough of that. In the idyllic hamlet of Harmony Falls, where sun-dabbled cobblestone streets once bore witness to the warmth of daylight and laughter, resonated like a harmonious symphony, an insidious force undulated through the shadows. Beneath her effervescent smile and globally renowned melodies lurked a pact with darkness, a sinister covenant that pledged her unparalleled success and unimaginable power. As her stardom ascended to celestial heights, an ominous presence trailed in her wake, casting an ethereal gloom upon the unsuspecting masses enraptured by her musical enchantments. While this was not her intent, and she was good at heart, nor did she know that she too would be being used for a darker force and an even more evil purpose. The malevolence didn't materialize abruptly. Instead, it insinuated itself into the very soul of her music, transmuting each note and lyric into a nefarious conduit for demonic influence. Unbeknownst to her and her adoring fans, the melodies they cherished metamorphosized into vessels for cryptic messages, inscribing themselves into the recesses of their subconscious minds. Unwittingly, those who attended her concerts exposed themselves to an unseen force, an ethereal current that permeated their very essence. The once joyous music, now corrupted and evolved into a vessel for dark power, whispering secrets that only those attuned to the malevolent symphony could decipher. Devoted fans found themselves ensnared by vivid nightmares and disconcerting dreams that transcended the boundaries of ordinary slumber. The more they immersed themselves into the enchanting music, the more tightly the grips on their hearts and minds became. The darkness within her and her music began to materialize in the physical realm, seeping into the collective consciousness of those enthralled by her song. The initial casualties were the once ardent Swifties, metamorphosized from ordinary fans into eerie disciples radiating an otherworldly glow and sporting unsettling, unbroken smiles. Their souls had been claimed, unknowing vessels from her dark and cryptic agenda. As she embarked on her global tours, her concerts underwent a macabre transformation into unholy rituals, attracting thousands of unsuspecting souls. The audience, blissfully ignorant, her, trying to be a symbol for community and togetherness, chanted verses laced with demonic power, unwittingly surrendering their life force to the malevolent force that lurked beneath the veneer of pop glamour. Whispers of peculiar occurrences at these concerts proliferated like wildfire. Tales of possessed fans, midnight rituals, and cryptic symbols embedded in her album artwork fueled a growing paranoia. Dissenting voices were swiftly silenced, drowned out by the ever-expanding legion of Swifties who remained blindly devoted to their pop idol. The world, once a rich tapestry of diverse cultures and ideologies, gradually succumbed to the demon's diabolical plan. The pop icon was lost. However, her image was not. Now being used as a means to force governments to crumble replaced by puppet leaders who danced to the demonic tunes orchestrated by the pop sensation, and more so, the demon that possessed her. Society itself decayed, eroded by the hypnotic rhythm of her song, leaving behind a desolate landscape where individuality became a distant memory. And Harmony Falls, a once bustling hub of community and joy, the streets now echoed with haunting melodies, reverberating through the very soul of the town. 
The once vibrant community around resembled a graveyard. The remnants of humanity were shadows enslaved by the siren song of a pop sensation turned demonic overlord. As her global domination continued unabated, her true form remained enshrouded in enigmatic darkness. The world, now ensnared in the symphony of despair orchestrated by the puppet master in disguise, teetered on the precipice of eternal darkness. Humanity, entranced and subdued, stood helpless against the impending doom, all orchestrated by the demon in plain sight. The world was a mere pawn in the demon's insidious game, and as its power grew, the abyss of eternal night loomed even larger on the horizon, casting a chilling shadow over the fate of humankind. The air was thick with the triumph of darkness, and the once vibrant tapestry of life unraveled into a void of everlasting night. The very fabric of reality trembled as the demon's machinations unfolded, weaving a tale of malevolence that transcended the boundaries of mortal comprehension. As the darkness spread, enveloping the globe in its sinister embrace, the whispers of resistance faded into echoes of despair. Any rebellion that dared to challenge the demon's reign was promptly crushed by her legion of Swifties, now fully consumed by the demonic force that pulsed through their veins. The rebels, once filled with hope, found themselves outmatched and outmaneuvered at every turn. Enchanted forests that had whispered forgotten truths now harbored malevolent spirits that tormented the rebels. The desolate landscapes became battlegrounds where the echoes of lost souls resonated in haunting agony. The ancient prophecies that once guided the rebels now seemed like cruel taunts, leading them further into the clutches of the dark demon's dominion. Sacred artifacts that were meant to wield immense power crumbled to dust at their touch as if the very essence of hope had abandoned them. The demon, sensing the rebellion's feeble attempts, reveled in her unholy triumph, her once charming visage now adorned in ethereal crown, her demonic form radiating an aura of unbridled power. The rebels faced battles of both physical and metaphysical nature, confronted not only by the twisted remnants of humanity, but also by the psychological warfare inflicted upon them. In the heart of Harmony Falls, where the darkness emanated most intensely, the rebels stumbled upon an ancient temple, its walls adorned with cryptic symbols and faded murals. The temple held a glimmer of hope for the rebellion. However, as they performed a ritual meant to awaken latent abilities, the very foundations of the temple seemed to reject their efforts. Meanwhile, the demon intensified her efforts to crush the rebellion. The once beloved pop sensation unleashed legions of Swifties, grotesque minions with eyes ablaze with otherworldly fire to quash any remaining resistance. The rebels faced not only physical adversaries, but also the overwhelming psychological assault of her malevolent influence. As a last ditch effort, the rebels attempted to bring forth the presence of what they called the Chosen One. They believed that they had been successful because as the Chosen One's power surged forth, a blinding light enveloped the temple, transcending the boundaries of reality. Yet, instead of the rebels feeling a cosmic alignment in their favor, the very fabric of existence seemed to recoil against them. The ritual, meant to awaken linked abilities, turned into a catastrophic event, with the temple crumbling and the Chosen One overwhelmed by the dark forces. In that climactic moment, the rebels faced her in a final desperate showdown. The cosmic clash between light and darkness unfolded, but this time, the demonic power proved insurmountable. The rebels, battered and broken, could only watch as their hopes shattered against the overwhelming forces of her malevolence. The Chosen One, meant to wield a power greater than hers, faltered in the face of the overwhelming darkness. The rebels, once defiant in their struggle, now knelt before the demonic overlord in defeat. As the rebels' feeble attempts faded into silence, the world succumbed entirely to her diabolical rule. The Chosen One, broken and defeated, vanished into obscurity, leaving behind a world forever altered by the suffocating embrace of eternal night. 
the once enslaved Swifties now fully indoctrinated into her dark legion, celebrated their unholy victory. The echoes of laughter were replaced by the haunting melodies of despair as the world plunged into everlasting night. The remnants of humanity stripped of individuality serving their demonic overlord with unwavering devotion. And this tale of the triumphant demon in plain sight became a dark legend etched into the annals of history. The rebellion's futile struggle served as a cautionary tale a stark reminder of the futility of resistance, the irresistible allure of her malevolent melodies. The world, shrouded in perpetual darkness, bowed before its new master. And that once vibrant tapestry of life became a macabre tapestry woven with threads of despair. Everybody has a demon. Most people just don't know it yet. I do. I can see them. They perch on your shoulders or ride piggyback, whispering in your ear. Sometimes they speak words that are soothing and sickly sweet. Other times, bitter and venomous. Some people's demons are tiny and innocuous, even cute. Others are brutes. Stupid, foul, and slovenly. Some are, in a word, abominations. Twisted, malevolent perversions who revel in misery and suffering. Those are the worst kind. You can tell a lot about a person by looking at their demon. My demon's name is Serana. Well, that's what I call her anyway. See, they never tell you their real names, and that's okay with me. Serana fits her just fine. I've known Serana for as long as I can remember. My whole life, actually. She's always been around. When I was lonely, Serana would play with me. When I was sad, Serana would crack jokes to make me laugh. When I was bored, Serana would tell me stories. Serana always knew the right things to say. When I was young, I thought my parents could see her too. They called Serana my imaginary friend, and my mother would tell the other moms about how creative her son Kevin is. He has such a vivid imagination. Sometimes they would ask me questions about Serana, or they would ask her questions about me. She would always answer, but I began to notice something strange. They never seemed to react quite right. It was like they weren't actually hearing her. They'd become smug and condescending and say things like, I think Serana is telling you to finish your green beans. Don't you think so, honey? I'd think that they were ignoring Serana on purpose, and then I'd get frustrated and start to cry. I was nine when I finally figured it out. They really couldn't see her. They were just playing along. They were... The ones pretending and not me. They were fools. I knew Serana was real. As real as anyone else. So I talk about her all the time. To my parents, my teachers, the kids at school, to anyone who would listen. I try to convince them that Serana was real. That's when it stopped being cute and my parents started to worry about me. Sometimes I'd lay in bed listening to them talk in the kitchen. My mother would get weepy and my father would speak quietly, his soothing words like balm. He'd say things like, it's just a phase, now grow out of it. All kids go through this, it just lasts longer for some. I lay there in bed with Serana by my side, comforting me. Why can't they see you? I'd ask. You have a gift, a special gift, they don't. Serana said, smiling. Well, why don't they believe me? I'm their son. Why do they think that I'd lie? That's just the way people are. You're very young, Kevin. You have owed so much to learn about the world. But I'll always be here for you, Kevin. You can count on me. I'll always be here for you. Around this time, I started getting into trouble at school. 
The other kids would make fun of me when I talked to Serana. They called me Crazy Kevin and Baby Boy Kevy Wevy, and they would laugh and punch the air and tell me that they were beating Serana up. They would taunt me and push me down, and when I tried to defend myself, I would get in trouble. Kids can be so cruel to one another, and the teachers weren't much better. They'd tell me, well, stop talking about your imaginary friend and the other kids would leave you alone. So I did. I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew that they were making fun of me because I was different. They didn't have imaginary friends and I did. And even though I knew Serana was real, no one else thought that she was. Imaginary friends weren't supposed to be real. The unknown scared them. I scared them. So I stopped talking about Serana and stopped talking to Serana. I ignored her, pretended that she wasn't real. And Serana got angry. Sometimes at night she would knock things over or throw things around my room to get my attention. Sometimes she would break things in my house and I'd get blamed. Even worse, she started appearing in my dreams, tying me up and torturing me in strange, primitive rituals chanting and carving esoteric symbols into my flesh, I'd wake up in a cold sweat, mind reeling. Serana would be hovering above my bed, quietly watching as I slept. Finally, when I couldn't stand the torment anymore, I started talking to her again, in whispers and only late at night while the rest of the house slept. I explained the situation to her, about my parents, my teachers, and even the kids at school. When I told her, she just smiled. She understood. Serana always understood. She told me that everybody has a demon. Just like me. Just, they can't see it. They don't know it exists. She told me that I was special. That I had a gift. I was still doubtful, but Serana wasn't upset. She told me I was so special that she was going to get me another gift, just to prove it. And then she disappeared. For the first time in my life, I was alone. I felt so scared and abandoned and just utterly alone. And I was miserable. A week passed and still no Serana. Was this how regular people lived out their lives? So lonely all the time? How did they stand it? Then I awoke one night and she was there standing over my bed like she'd never left. I was so happy. Where'd you go, Serana? I asked. To get your gift, of course. But where is it? You already have it. Serana answered. But where? You didn't get me anything. Shh. Quiet, child. It'll all make sense in the morning. Go to sleep now, Kevin. Go to sleep, child. She sang me a lullaby in some ancient tongued language as I drifted off. I awoke the next morning as excited as a kid on Christmas, ready to run out of my bedroom and see my new gift. But Serana grabbed me by the arm and spoke to me sternly. You must make a promise to me, Kevin. Whatever you see out there, you must promise never to tell anyone about it. You must never speak of it aloud. Otherwise, your gift will disappear. Otherwise, I will disappear. I promised. Promise me three times. Serana said, so I did. You've promised me thrice never to speak of what you see. Do not forget your promise, Kevin. We walked into the kitchen and I stopped dead in my tracks. There at the breakfast table sat my mother and father, on each of their shoulders perched a demon. One on my mother's sat a large, puffy creature. A mix between a bunny rabbit and a giant marshmallow. But with huge, doughy eyes and long, silver fangs. On my father's sat a long, skinny, worm-like creature with hollow eyes in the face of a bat. It was a weird blue and translucent thing, kind of like ice. A cloud of steam rose from its body. Its tail was coiled around my father's neck. I yelped in surprise and eight eyes turned towards me, four human and four demonic. 
I made some excuse to my parents, which calmed them down. But the demons stared at me wide-eyed at first, and I thought that they were angry. But then I recognized that they were actually afraid. Afraid of me. Afraid that I could see them. The bat snake hissed something that I couldn't understand, but Serana barked back in a gruff, guttural language which echoed in our tiny kitchen. My parents' demons cowered before her submissively. From that day forward, I saw them everywhere I went. It was scary, to be sure, but at least I knew that I wasn't the only one. Everybody has a demon. Still, it could be overwhelming. There were so many, and they all knew that I knew. They would say things to me. Horrible things. They would brag about all the twisted and perverted acts that they had convinced their people to commit. They would tell me about their people's evil thoughts and dark secrets. The demons delighted in recounting these tales in graphic detail. Sometimes Serana would stop them, but sometimes she wouldn't. Or even worse, she couldn't. Some of them were scarier than Serana, stronger than Serana, and there was nothing that she could do. Sometimes I would catch an evil glint in Serana's eye and I could tell that she was enjoying hearing all about the wicked and foul deeds other demons had convinced their people to do. She almost seemed jealous. It became too much. I had to make some changes. I would walk to school instead of riding the bus. I began avoiding crowds and started spending my free time alone in my room or out hiking in the woods, but it was no use. I started falling behind in school. It was impossible to concentrate in class with all those demons glaring at me, whispering to me, and laughing at me. I told Serana about this, but she shrugged it off. She reminded me that this was a gift and that I was special. She promised me that one day I would be glad I had it. And I trusted her. Serana was always there for me. Serana always took care of me. Sometimes I felt afraid. I could always tell who the really bad people were by the size and nastiness of their demons. I could see all of the liars and adulterers and rapists and murderers and child molesters. They walked the streets, mingling in secret with the good people and the normal people, like wolves among sheep. And nobody knew but me. You'd be surprised just how many of them there are. And there was nothing that I could do about it. At least, not yet. That changed in 10th grade when I met Elijah. Elijah was a bully and he didn't try to hide it. He was a fat, ugly, hulking slob of a boy. He was stupid too. Book stupid or willfully ignorant at the very least. But when it came to bullying, he was a genius. He seemed to make it his personal mission to torment the smaller weaker and more introverted kids, of which I was one. He also had one of the nastiest demons that I'd ever seen. It was a massive, hippopotamus-looking beast with twisted horns and breath like the grave. It lay across his shoulders, making Elijah slouch when he walked. The popular kids ignored most of us, but they despised Elijah. In his mind, that was our fault, and he made sure that we paid for it. He loved to trip kids in the hallway, knock books out of their hands, snap girls' bras, fire spitballs in class, and generally make all our lives a living hell. Elijah's specialty was stealing lunches, and he did it with aplomb. I never once saw him buy a lunch or bring his own. He simply went from table to table, taking what he wanted from the nerds. He always made sure to take my milk, I didn't even think he liked it, but he knew that I liked it, so he had to take it, chug it, and throw the empty carton in my face, laughing all the while. Serana started whispering things to me, telling me what a horrible person Elijah was, telling me all the nasty things that he did when he was alone, telling me how he reveled and tortured and killing people's pets out in the woods, telling me about the things that he would do to his little sister late at night telling me all the horrible things that he would do in the future. Telling me that if Elijah died, 
no one would miss him. I tried to ignore her, but the longer it went on, the more sense Serana seemed to make. The final straw came one day when Elijah caught me alone in the bathroom. I was standing at the urinal peeing when I heard the door open, and heavy footsteps came in from behind. Aww, oh, look at this. It's little crazy Kevy Wevy having a well pee pee break. He sneered. His breath was hot on my neck like a foul breeze wafting from a garbage dump on a scorching summer day. I ignored him, trying to finish the task at hand as quickly as possible. What's wrong, faggot? You deaf or something? He asked, and I continued ignoring him. Big mistake. He kicked me hard on the backpack, smashing my chest into the urinal and my face into the concrete wall. I saw stars and fell to the ground, my member still in my hand. Still urinating. Oh no! Look at that! Low Kevy fell down and wet himself. Here, let me help you with that. I lay on the ground in a daze and I heard pants unzip somewhere above me. Then a warm, putrid stream was poured over my backpack and down my legs and Elijah was laughing. I covered my head and pretended that I was somewhere else. And when it was over, I heard the door slam shut, and from the hallway, Elijah yelled, Hey, everybody! Check it out! Crazy Kevin pissed himself! I looked up, and there was my demon, Serana. She was staring at me with a smirk on her face. Okay. You win. Tell me what I have to do. Serana's smile widened. Easy. She said. Switch to almond milk. For the next two weeks, I packed my lunch with almond milk instead of my regular 2%. It tasted disgusting, but I hardly ever got to drink it anyways. Elijah stole it from me every single day without fail, and he really seemed to enjoy the taste. Then one day after school, a knock came at my door. It was a stranger, disheveled and wild-eyed, dressed in a cheap suit. His demon was a snake, red as venomous blood. Venom dripping from its maw. He didn't say a word, just handed me a crumpled paper bag and walked away. I opened the bag and pulled out a clear vial with a strip of masking tape on the side. On the masking tape, in clear black sharpie marker, one single word was written. Cyanide. Serana was grinning again. Tastes like almond. She whispered. I mixed it into my milk for tomorrow's lunch, and the next day I ditched the empty vial in the dumpster on my way to school. A few minutes after drinking my milk, Elijah was convulsing on the floor, and I sat and watched casually, munching on a taco. A few minutes after he was dead, I wasn't sad. I actually felt good, better than I had in a long time. The cause of death was determined to be cerebral hypoxia, likely brought on by a stroke. Very few mourned his passing. I started missing more and more school, and a few months later I dropped out completely. Not that I felt guilty or thought that I might get caught. No way. I just had other more important work to do. I got a job in a rough part of the city, working in a crumbly old bookbinding factory. The work was monotonous, but easy, and I soon saved enough to buy a used car and rent a shitty studio apartment. I worked second shift at the factory, from 3pm to 11pm. Most guys hated those hours, but I found them perfect for supporting my extracurricular activities. Finding bad people and killing them. My demon helped me. Serana was a real natural when it came to this. She helped me track down people with particularly nasty demons, and she'd tell me all the vile things that they had done. We stalked them like hunters, learning their patterns and routines. Then she'd tell me the best way to kill them and how to get away with it. And I always got away with it. Hemp's, rapists, drug dealers, child molesters, human traffickers. I did them all. Sometimes I made it look like an accident or a suicide or a robbery gone wrong. I beat, 
stabbed and strangled, shod and drowned. I even pushed one fat fucker on the third rail off the subway. He fried just like bacon. He even smelt like it too. Serrano was always there for me, protecting me, making sure that I got away with it. The best part was, I never felt bad about it. Every person that I killed was a wretched excuse for a human being. They deserved it. I was making the world a better place. Some might even say that I was a hero. My conscience was clear, and I slept like a baby. Killing people became a normal thing for me. Fun, even. That was my hobby, and I was damn good at it. Eventually, I didn't even think about it anymore. I just did it. And that's when it all came unraveled. I was out on patrol one night, following the SUV of a mid-level drug dealer as he made his pickups. He must have made me, because as we came to an intersection, he slowed down and waited until the light was about to change from yellow to red, then floored the gas pedal. I tried to follow, but I must have been a second too late because a black BMW going the other way smashed into the side of my car, T-boning me and sending me spinning through the intersection. My head must have slammed into the steering wheel briefly because I had lost consciousness. When I came to, my ears were ringing and stars danced in my eyes. Smoke drifted from the front of my car. Then I heard another noise. Angry, screaming, and cursing. The owner of the BMW was striding towards me. A mountain of a man, face red and fists clenched, arms swinging, spittle flying from his mouth as he screamed. I lurched from my seat to face him, blood pouring from the gash on my forehead. Straddling the man's shoulders was one of the most horrific demons that I had ever seen. It was huge, round, and pale white and bloated like a corpse, pus oozing from a thousand sores covered its corpulent body. It had no arms or legs. Instead, its entire mass was one giant face consisting of two tiny, beady black eyes and one enormous, gaping mouth filled with a row upon row of razor-sharp teeth. A forked tongue slithered snake-like through its fangs, flitting through the air, searching for a victim. I felt bile rise from my throat, and I fought it down. As the man surged towards me, I felt my rage again, and I felt myself thinking about Elijah, about all the times that he had teased me, tormented me, humiliated me. I thought I heard a subtle whisper in my ear. Do it. My mind went blank. My vision went white around the edges. I felt like I was trapped behind my eyes, searching, unable to control what was happening. The man was close, screaming in my face, and he meant to hurt me. I reached into my pocket, then a flash of chrome in the streetlight. A hot torrent sprayed me in the face, the man's eyes bulging with rays one moment, then rolling back into his skull. His body slumped to the ground, my knife buried in his throat. I looked to Serrano for help, but she was just laughing. Laughing like a psycho and screeching something in that foul, ancient language. Realization set in. I'd done this man. Done him out in the open, at a city intersection, under a streetlight, with no planning or forethought, with no escape route and no plan for cleanup. I turned to Serana in panic. Are you just going to stand there laughing? Help me! Tell me what to do! How to fix this! She was just howling now. This one was all you. I had nothing to do with it. The man you just killed was a politician, a city councilman. Perhaps no less of a criminal than the pimps and gangbangers we normally kill. But this guy did it under the guise of law and order. I didn't make you do this. You chose this. I could also feel my face go white as a ghost, and the world began to spin around me. I was stumbling towards the car, trying not to vomit, when I heard the noise behind me. Followed by the scream of a siren. A cascade of red and blue lights reflected off the windows of my car and the shops around me. The cruiser peeled out from the gas station across the intersection and rushed towards me. 
I sat in the interrogation room for hours. Serana stood there next to me, smirking as the detectives worked me over. It all came out. They found everything. Enough evidence in my car and my apartment to tie me to dozens of murders. They said it would be a miracle if I got life in prison. The DA would go for the death penalty on this one for sure. And they were laughing. And their demons were laughing. <laughs> and Serrano was laughing too. <laughs> My court-appointed lawyer was a mousy man with thick glasses and mustard stains on his suit jacket. His demon was a small, skittering cockroach with a sallow face of a dead baby. He did not seem optimistic about my chances. The only hope to avoid the death penalty, he said, was to claim guilty by insane or mentally ill. Now, have you ever felt like you weren't in control of your actions? Have you ever heard voices in your head telling you to do things? Someone speaking to you, maybe? God, the devil, or maybe even demons? I pondered for a moment. Serana was smiling, but her stare was black. Don't forget your promise. You swore to me. You swore three times. Never to tell anyone. I remember. I replied. But this is no gift. It's a curse, and I'm glad to be through with you. My old lawyer looked confused. Who are you talking to? A demon, I said. Everybody has a demon. Most people just can't see them. My demon is named Serana. And yes, she tells me to do things. Now I'm all alone. Serana is gone. Gone forever. I sit here in a straitjacket with these four padded walls waiting for my pills. Waiting to forget. I'll never see the sunshine again. Everybody has a demon. Everybody. Except for me. Alright. I'd like to first introduce myself. I am George Orson. I'm an orderly at the mental facility where Kevin is being held. Because I'm sure you might have been a little bit curious about how a man in a straitjacket is, you know, letting you know all about this story. See, the thing is, Kevin is probably the most sane patient that I've ever seen. And it's a shame what the system has done to him. I actually support his work. He was making the world a better place, even if his means were a bit, uh, extreme. We've spoken of his demons at length, and I thought that his story needed to be told. To that end, I snuck an audio recorder into the facility and allowed Kevin to record his story. Which is how it came to be that you now know, and I know, everybody has a demon. You just can't see him. I sat on my hard, worn out couch, chain smoked as I stared at the constant black and white static showing on my ancient television set. I'm so tired, but I can't sleep. I can't remember when I was able to rest, let alone feel safe or secure in my home. I'm so bored that I hope that something, anything, will happen. But at the same time, I'm conflicted, because I know what occurs in this cursed building and all the fear and chaos that comes with it. But if I'm experiencing pure terror pulsating through my veins, then at least I'm feeling something. The noise has stopped, at least. The constant banging and scratching on the walls and disembodied voices emanating from the walkways outside my door. These unnatural sounds are always unsettling and they mean that I'm never at ease. But somehow, the ominous silence... It's even worse, as I hear nothing but the buzzing static from the TV, reminding me that I'm alone. 
Eventually, I dragged myself up from the couch, my old bones creaking as I slowly walked towards the window and looked out at the empty wasteland beyond. The landscape is lifeless, a desolate hellscape going on as far as the eye can see, and it's all shrouded in darkness. It's always night here. The building is lit up by flickering light strips in the corridors and apartments, but the only illumination outside comes from the pale orb in the black sky above. Not the sun or the moon, but something else. I can't remember when I last saw sunlight, blue skies, clouds, or any greener whatsoever. And God, I miss them all. I didn't know how lucky I was in the old world, in so many respects. I don't spend long looking out into the darkness, and I know it's dangerous to do so. Several of my neighbors have gone mad after staring into the abyss for far too long as the darkness consumes them and destroys whatever glimmer of hope that they had left. And then there are the inhabitants in the outer world, the beasts that stalk the land, their hideous silhouettes barely visible under the dim light of the pale orb. Although one can occasionally hear their predatory roars or banshee-like wails in the distance, carrying across the empty plains, Thankfully, the land beasts rarely approach our isolated building, and even if they did, the walls should keep them at bay. The winged beasts from above are a different matter, however. It's never occurred to me to try to escape our prison and take my chances in the desert wasteland. Um, a couple of my neighbors have attempted this, managed to force open windows or cut through the wire mesh above the courtyard. But those few who have made it out always return, their eyes wide with terror as they ramble incoherently about monstrosities and horrors beyond comprehension. Those unfortunate souls will often barricade themselves inside their small apartments, sealing the door shut and boarding up all the windows. It can be years before they emerge again, if they do at all. I continued to ponder such terrors when I was shaken back to reality by the crackling sound emanating from my walkie-talkie, my primary means of communication with our cursed community, the neighbors who were my responsibility to supervise and support. When I left the receiver, a dull and emotionless voice told me that the delivery of special items had arrived at the front entrance, and I must go down to sign and collect for said items. I felt relieved that at least now, I had some purpose to my day, although I dread the chaos that will likely follow the distribution. Nevertheless, this is my job and my responsibility, and so I took a final drag of my cigarette before descending to the ground below. I opened the first door and came face to face with the dead eyes of the delivery man, his wrinkled face devoid of expression or even compassion. I gave up trying to engage this man in conversation a long time ago. In fact, I'm not sure that the delivery man is even human. Perhaps he's nothing more than a supernatural drone worker designed for this sole purpose. Behind the unblinking delivery man is the second door, sealed tightly shut. I've never seen what lies beyond the outer door and I have no desire to do so. Instead, my focus is on the bulky boxed items that I will take ownership of and deliver using my trusty sack burrow trolley and our not-so-reliable old and creaky elevator. I avoided the delivery man's dead eyes as I scribbled my signature on his sheet and began shifting the containers and boxes into the lobby. I had no idea what the point of me signing my name is, and I can only assume it's some kind of meaningless, bureaucratical ritual design to further sap my morale. In any event... I quickly transferred the contents into the lobby and shut the door on the zombie-like delivery man, sighing with relief as I heard him exit through the second door, returning to whatever hellscape lay beyond. The items took me time to deliver, as I brought the different sized containers up one by one in the elevator. Dr. Marshall's item is always the largest, a heavy ice cooler box filled with, I dread to think, 
Hawk will empty the cooler box and leave it outside his door for me to collect. Molly does whatever he does with its contents. The other boxes vary in size and weight. I don't know what's inside the majority of them. Once again, I'm happy to remain ignorant. I walk to the balconies on each floor, looking down at the empty courtyard below and up at the black sky again, glancing warily through the wire mesh that was securing the roof of our building. Carefully, I left the boxes on each and every doorstep, but I did not knock on said doors or attempt to interact with the residents inside the apartments. I would be happy to avoid my neighbors for as long as possible, but know that this is unlikely. As always, I feel conflicted, as I dread my interactions with the crazies and damned souls who live within the hellish complex but at the same time yearn for any kind of human contact. Nevertheless, I avoid the others as I finish my deliveries, then returning to my own dark and decrepit apartment alone as the sweat poured from my skin. There are no seasons in the realm that I can tell, but the temperature is always uncomfortably hot and humid or bitterly cold. I can only assume that these changes in climate are within the whim of whatever sadistic deity designed this hellish world. I dropped my own special item on the coffee table, a fresh carton of cigarettes that will allow me to continue my filthy habit. My wife Janet was always nagging me to quit, but in this place chain smoking is the only stress relief that I have. Besides, it's a little late for me to start worrying about lung cancer. I went straight to the small bathroom, splashing cold water on my face and enjoying some small relief. But then I glanced up and saw that the red patch growing on the bathroom ceiling, watching the slow drip of the crimson liquid falling into my bathtub. I knew what it was in an instant. Blood. I suppose the natural reaction to seeing blood leaking through one ceiling should be disgust and terror. But what I felt in that moment was anger and frustration. I stormed back out of my bathroom and grabbed my walkie-talkie from the coffee table, my hands still shaking with fury as I set the frequency and made the call. Dr. Marshall, I stated firmly down the line, merely suppressing the anger in my voice. There was a lengthy pause before I received a response, as a surprisingly meek voice broke through the static. Yes? How can I help? Doctor, I need you to come down here straight away. I ordered. Oh, I see. The doc answered. Okay then, I'll see you shortly. Two minutes later, Dr. Marshall was standing in my bathroom, glancing up at the blood stain in my ceiling with a look of mild embarrassment etched across his thin, pasty face. Dr. Marshall technically wasn't a fully qualified MD, although I understand he did attend a couple of years of medical school where he picked up some surgical skills. He used what he had learned to indulge in his disturbing interests until the authorities caught up with him, and he ended up here. But, as they say, a leopard cannot change its spots, and this is the cause of our current predicament. Dr. Marshall isn't much to look at, being a slight figure with pale skin and thinning hairline. He speaks in a soft and apologetic tone and seems very unassuring and unthreatening at first glance. But of course, there is a dark side to the man that makes him very dangerous. Nevertheless, the doctor knew why he was here, and so was immediately on the defensive. Oh dear, I must apologize for the mess. All very unfortunate. I'm afraid I let my enthusiasm get the better of me, and such is my passion for my work. He smiled thinly as he glanced across at me with his killer's eyes. I avoided his gaze feeling a cold chill running through me as my discomfort lessened my anger. Doc, we agreed that if you were to continue your... experiments, you would make sure to keep the blood and smell under control. This isn't the first incident. I have received other complaints. There was an annoyance in his voice as he answered. Well, perhaps you can bill me for the damage. It was a facetious question, of course. He knew very well that I had no power over him, except for the one thing. Dr. Marshall, I said firmly, you know very well that your special deliveries come from my management. And if they were to be made aware of the incidents, then they may reconsider this arrangement. Now, 
You wouldn't want that, Doc. Would ya? I did make eye contact with the man after I finished delivering my thinly veiled threat. I instantly regretted doing so, however. As he shot me a murderous glare, I could imagine what was going through his mind in that moment as he was surely fantasizing about dissecting me inch by inch inside of his bathtub. But the doc was smart enough to know that that was impossible. After a tension-filled pause, his eyes softened, and he spoke in a more conciliatory tone. I apologize profusely, sir. This will not happen again. I didn't believe him. We'd had this conversation before and no doubt would again. But right then, I wanted him out of my apartment, and so I accepted his false assurances. I went on to plaster and paint my bathroom ceiling as a temporary fix before I sat back down on my couch and waited. Although, for what? I could not say. I don't know how long it was before I received the next call through my walkie-talkie. A noise complaint about number 13. That was Mrs. Jackson's apartment, across the walkway from mine. I groaned aloud, dreading the house call that would follow, but knowing that it was necessary. Soon after, I found myself in Widow Jackson's front room, sipping tea from the woman's finest china as I scanned the neatly decorated and immaculately maintained surroundings, with quirky little ornaments set upon carefully dusted shelves, alongside lovingly framed family photographs, reminders of better times. Mrs. Jackson herself sat on the chair opposite me, smiling politely as she offered me a biscuit from a neatly stacked pile on a matching plate. She's a frail woman with kind eyes and a sweet smile, but the wrinkles on her face told the story, as did the immeasurable sadness behind her gaze. Life had not been kind on Widow Jackson, and she's paid dearly for her mistakes. The cozy living room seemed warm and welcoming to the casual observer, but there were subtle signs that something wasn't right, if he knew where to look for them. At closer glance, the family portraits were disturbing. There was Mrs. Jackson, her late husband, and three children, except the face of the middle child had been scratched out on each and every photograph, replaced by an ominous dark circle. This was Johnny the black sheep of the family, and the only child still with his mother. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I thought about the padlocked bedroom just yards from where we sat, and I hoped that the door was secure enough to contain the monster within. I smiled faintly after taking a sip of the sweet tea and cleared my throat before bringing up the difficult issue. <clears throat> um, Miss Jackson, uh, I thank you for your hospitality as always, but I'm afraid that this isn't a social call. Oh, I see, the widow answered, her smile disappearing as her face suddenly dropped. As if on cue, Johnny began one of his furious tantrums, slamming his fists against the door and walls and screaming like a banshee. The terrible din made my head pound as Mrs. Jackson screamed out. Johnny, we have a visitor. Behave yourself, damn you. I could hear the anger and frustration in her voice and recognized a woman on the edge. Johnny took little notice of his mother's shouted words, continuing to scream and bang with all the fury in hell until he eventually tired himself out. With peace temporarily restored, Mrs. Jackson looked up at me with tears in her eyes. I know they're a problem, Johnny's outbursts, but you need to know that I'm doing my best. It's not fair on him being locked up in the room all the time. I shook my head whilst interjecting. You know we can't let him out. Not after what happened last time. My body shook as the horrifying memories came flooding back. Mrs. Jackson surely shared my trauma, as all of the color suddenly drained from her face. Oh, no, she claimed defensively. I'm not suggesting that at all, but surely we can make some alterations to make him more comfortable and the medicine they send for him i keep saying the dosage is too low can you speak to management sir you could make them listen i know you can she was pleading with me begging for my help 
I felt terrible because there was nothing that I could do. Management would never agree to her requests, and there was no point even asking them. Still, I couldn't bear to say no to Widow Jackson, not after everything that she's been through. Okay, I'll talk to him, I finally answered. Thank you, sir, she answered emotionally. You're a good man. Suddenly, I couldn't bear to stay in that room because I knew that she was wrong. I wasn't a good man. Far from it. I made my excuses, setting down my mug and heading for the door. But to my surprise, Mrs. Jackson jumped up from her chair, placing a firm hand on my forearm as she stopped me from leaving. I turned to face the woman, seeing her eyes now filled with an uncharacteristic intensity. She spoke to me like she'd never done before, as the raw emotion seeped into her words. They say that he's a monster, and I know that he's done terrible things. God, I know that better than anyone, but he's my son, my baby boy. I can't turn my back on him, not ever. Johnny's all that I've got left, and I've got to protect him. You understand that, don't you, sir? I felt the tears welling up in my eyes, her words having struck me like a fist in the stomach. I broke free from her grasp, muttering something incoherent before departing to the front door. And as I ran out, I heard Johnny beginning yet another furious tantrum, screaming and banging as his mother pleaded for him to stop. I couldn't deal with this, however, instead fleeing like a coward as I retreated to the relative sanctuary of my own apartment. I dwelt on the encounter with Mrs. I dwelt on the encounter with Widow Jackson for some time after, her words repeating in my head as I experienced intense feelings of pain and guilt. Did she know what I'd done? Was she privy to the terrible secret that I carried in my broken heart? I suppose none of us are innocent in this place. My train of thought was suddenly interrupted by a ruckus outside my door as something big and fast tore along the balcony below. I instinctively jumped up, sensing danger, as I grabbed my shotgun from its cabinet and filled my pockets with spare cartridges. A moment later, I was out on my balcony looking down, my weapon in hand as I searched for the threat under the dim strip lights. I saw a figure below who I initially didn't recognize in the dark, but then the figure called out to me from the courtyard, and I recognized his voice. Don't shoot at me, sir. It's only me. I'm afraid Cerberus got loose again. I rolled my eyes in frustration before replying. God damn it, Mr. Jones, I exclaimed, shouting down at my downstairs neighbor. I thought that I told you to keep that beast under control. I know, sir. I'm sorry, Jones replied. He's a good pet, really. Just a bit boisterous. I could have laughed at Mr. Jones's flippant statement. Calling Cerberus a bit boisterous was like saying Jack the Ripper was a bit naughty. But it was my responsibility to help bring the beast to heel before it did someone serious harm. <sighs> Where is he now? I demanded impatiently. Last time I saw him, he was heading for the basement. Fantastic, I replied sarcastically shouldering my shotgun and returning to my apartment to retrieve my torch before I descended to the elevator to join Mr. Jones and begin our search. I slowly made my way through the darkened basement, torch in hand, as I surveyed the scene of damage and devastation, observing the shelves and boxes that had been knocked over during Cerberus's wild rampage. I turned back to Mr. Jones, shining the torch to illuminate his face and taking some satisfaction as the old eyes blinked from exposure to light. We best split up to cover more ground, I said, instantly realizing what a bad idea that was. Don't be shooting the damn gun at my boy, Mr. Jones cried. I scoffed before turning away. Frankly, I doubt that the buckshot in my gun would do the beast much harm, even in the unlikely case that I could even get a shot off. I followed the trail of destruction my heart beating fast in my chest, and my breathing becoming labored as I nervously scanned the path in front of me, the torch shaking in my hand. I froze when I heard the low, animalistic growl coming out of the darkness. 
instinctively I backed off, only to trip over a discarded box falling heavily and dropping my gun and torch. The beast recognized my weakened state and charged. Its huge frame propelled across the dark void, and I felt the immense weight hitting my chest, forcing me back down onto the floor. Sharp claws dug into my ribcage, making me scream out in pain and shock. I heard the jaws snapping just inches from my face as I closed my eyes, preparing for the worst. But suddenly, there was a high-pitched whistle, and the beast looked up, releasing me from its death grip and galloping across the basement floor. I warily looked up in time to see the silhouette of Mr. Jones standing in front of the basement door with a dim artificial light from the stairwell behind him. The wolf-like form of Cerberus jumped up to meet his master. The beast's aggressive nature now transformed into friendly obedience as its owner rewarded him with a treat. I gathered myself retrieving my torch and gun before shouting angrily at my neighbor. Damn it, Jones! That monster almost bit my head clean off! How many times do I have to tell you? Keep him on a leash! Yes, yes, Mr. Jones replied as he patted his pet on the head. This will be the last time, I promise. I rolled my eyes in frustration, knowing he was full of crap, but realizing that there wasn't a thing that I could do about it. I returned to my apartment and examined my claw wounds in the bathroom mirror. Unsurprisingly, my shirt was ripped to hell, but my injuries had already started to heal. This was always the way in this place. Sometimes I wished that I would receive a fatal wound that would end my misery once and for all, and I knew that there was no chance of this happening. Management wouldn't let me off the hook so easily. I cleaned myself up and went back to the couch, sitting silently and waiting for the next inevitable emergency. I don't know how long it took until I received the next call. An ominous burst of static that came through my walkie-talkie. I reached out, instinctively knowing that it would be something bad. <sighs> Hello, I began. It's Bach. You need to get out here. Bring your shotgun. My stomach churned upon hearing those words. The caller hadn't introduced himself, but I recognized his voice. Mr. Hastings. One of my less troublesome neighbors, if I'm honest. Mostly he kept to himself, but Hastings had the misfortune of living at the top floor, which put him in the front line, so to speak. His call for help and request for me to bring my gun could only mean one thing. We had a fight on our hands. I reached the top floor and found Mr. Hastings crouched in the shadows by the stairwell, his trusty crossbow in hand as he looked upwards with the intensity in his dark eyes. He didn't turn in my direction as I stealthily approached, remaining low and staying as quiet as possible as I joined him, ducking down beside my neighbor as we hid in the shadows. I knew from past experience that Hastings didn't scare easily, but when I got up close I saw the sweat pouring from his brow, his knuckles white as he clutched too tight a hold of his weapon. He nodded upwards, drawing my attention to the scene above our heads. To my horror, I saw the dark shape of the beast which had landed on top of the wire mesh, our thin protection against the terrors that ruled the dark skies of this realm. This creature was one such beast, largely the size and shape of a human being, but with a vast pair of wings that allowed it to soar like a bird of prey, and with claws and teeth which could easily rip a body to shreds. The harpy-like monster was busily working on the thin cage, diligently tearing away at the wire with its claws in an attempt to break its way through. The winged monster was making steady progress, and it wouldn't be long before it forced its way inside. This was something that we couldn't allow to happen. I tried to control my shaking body as I whispered to my companion's ear, deferring to Mr. Hastings' superior knowledge in this field. How do you want to handle this? I asked. We've got the outflank it. You cover me, and I'll move along the balcony and hit it with her behind. I nodded my head, not feeling entirely confident about my neighbor's plan, but knowing that I couldn't offer a better alternative. I watched Hastings move, keeping low in the shadows whilst barely making a sound. I looked back at the harpy, my hands still shaking as I grabbed the two cartridges from my pocket and carefully loaded them into my shotgun. But the metallic clicking sound alerted the beast to my presence 
as suddenly it stopped what it was doing and glared down at me with burning red eyes, snarling as it exposed its fangs in a hideous display. A terrifying pause ensued as I found myself transfixed, unable to avert my eyes from the beast's demonic gaze. But then all hell broke loose as the beast roared with fury, redoubling its efforts as it ripped the wire cage apart, determined to get to me and devour my still warm flesh. Acting on pure fear and adrenaline, I raised my gun and fired. And again. The buckshot hit the winged beast, causing it pain and irritation, but no serious injury. I desperately plunged my hand back into my pocket to retrieve fresh cartridges, but the harpy was almost in, ready to descend and rip me to shreds. But suddenly I saw movement in the corner of my eye, spotting a dark figure emerging from the shadows, and then a projectile flying through the air at speed. The bolt struck the winged beast in its left leg, and I took a perverse pleasure as it shrieked in pain, unveiling its wings and ascending in a blind panic, flying back into the dark skies above, defeated and humiliated. I breathed a sigh of immense relief as I watched the harpy disappear before Mr. Hastings came back by my side, the now unloaded crossbow still in his hands. My neighbor looked up at the hole in the wire cage and shook his head. More will come. That will need to be fixed, he said. Then I nodded my head, shaking myself back to reality as I dealt with the shock of the last few moments. Yeah, I replied solemnly. I'll get my ladder and start working on the repair straight away. Okay, Hastings answered coolly before walking down the dimly lit walkway and back towards his apartment, leaving me alone to my work. It was quiet for a time after the harpy attack but I didn't know how long this would last. I needed some relief after all I'd seen and suffered, and so I decided to continue with my secret project. Remembering the brief glimpse that I'd previously enjoyed, which had kept a glimmer of hope alive in my otherwise blackened heart. After finishing yet another cigarette, I reached for the dial on my TV set, my hand once again shaking, but this time with excitement and anticipation rather than cold terror. I twisted the dial to tune the device and searched for the channel that I yearned for, ignoring the sinister otherworldly images and sounds that appeared on screen and reverberated throughout the speakers. Finally, I saw the image that I'd been searching for, finely tuned to sharpen the picture. My heart almost jumped out of my chest when I saw her face. My Janet. As beautiful as the day that I married her. All those long years ago. The long blonde hair, deep blue eyes, and soft, delicate features all remaining unchanged and untainted. And no, she wasn't the same. Not anymore. Her eyes, once filled with passion, joy, and love, were now sullen and bloodshot. Her expression sorrowful and grief-stricken. And there was something worse. As I realized her heart was filled with a righteous fury... Janet, I whimpered, my emotions getting the better of me. Is that really you? Her reply was sharp and brutal, and she snarled at me through the television set. What the hell do you want, you bastard? And I was taken aback, struggling to find the words to respond. I, I, I wanted to apologize. To tell you how sorry I am. She laughed aloud in open mockery, <laughs> saying, You're sorry? So what? It makes no difference. You know it's too late for apologies. Look, I desperately interjected. I know what I did was terrible, and you've got every right to be angry, Janet. But you've got to believe I've changed. I don't expect you to forgive me, but let me see my girls at least, please. You owe me that much. She scoffed in disgust and my heartfelt plea. Losing control, she launched into a ferocious tirade. You will never see your children again. What happened to the girls was your fault. We don't want you in our world. We don't need you. You can rot in hell for all of eternity for all I care. My jaw dropped and my whole body trembled uncontrollably 
as I looked in her hate-filled eyes and felt all my resolve collapsing. And then, suddenly my wife's face disappeared from the television screen, replaced by an image that brought back buried memories of immense grief and guilt. I saw a graveyard on a lonely hillside, with black-clad, tearful mourners gathering around three coffins, watching solemnly as they were lowered into the waiting graves one by one. The first coffin was full-sized, while the other two were notably smaller, designed for children. The tears were rolling down my cheeks in an unstoppable stream as I reached out to touch the cold screen. But as soon as I did so, the image changed again, with a face barely visible through the static. It wasn't my wife's face this time. Instead, I saw a hideous death mask, an inhuman creature with dark, soulless eyes. It opened its mouth to reveal a gaping black hole, emanating a high-pitched scream that forced me to retreat from my TV recoiling in horror as I covered my ears in a futile attempt to drown out the awful din. Mercifully, the hellish wailing did not last, as the TV set shut itself off and left me alone in my silent living room, shaking and terrified by what I'd just witnessed. I knew I'd screwed up badly, and there would be consequences. I just didn't expect it to happen so soon. I jumped with fright when I heard the ringing, fearfully looking across the dust-covered red phone affixed to my living room wall. This phone could not be used for outgoing calls, and when it rang, this only meant one thing, that the building manager wanted to speak with me. I slowly walked across the laminate floor and reached out to pick up the receiver, holding it up to my ear as I spoke meekly. Hello? I squeaked. I expected the familiar voice on the other side to angrily berate me, but instead, his tone was surprisingly sympathetic. What's going on, buddy? He inquired calmly. I felt immense shame and struggled to find the words to justify my actions. I messed up. I know I did. I just thought that I could talk to her. I could make her understand. It's not permitted. You know this. You're not doing anyone any favors by trying to make contact. I shook my head, trying to keep my emotions in check. But I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for the mistakes that I've made. My remorse is genuine. Can you not see that? Oh, I see it. The manager replied impatiently. But it's not enough. You committed a grave sin and this is your assigned punishment. That's the way that it is. I whimpered, sobbing as I spoke my next words. How long? How long must I stay in this place? For as long as we say, came the manager's uncompromising reply. You'll stay and do your job until such time as we consider your punishment is complete. Now, I suggest you be a good warden and quit complaining. Follow the rules, my friend. And remember, there are always worse places that we can send you. Understand? An ice-cold chill ran through me as I considered his sinister words and imagined the grotesque hellscapes which lay beyond our strange little apartment block. I understand, I muttered meekly, as my last resolve melted away. Good. The manager responded before promptly hanging up the phone, leaving me to listen to the ominous dial tone. And so, this is my story, or at least as much of it as I wish to share with you. I remain trapped here, warden to a bizarre apartment block on the edge of a desolate hellscape. I can't exactly say where I am, but I do know why I'm here and I realize I deserve my punishment. Time is difficult to gauge in this realm, and honestly, I don't know whether the incidents that I have described in this account occurred over a day, a week, a month, or even a year. It makes no odds, I suppose. This is my existence, my sentence, 
and I shall continue to carry out my duties as warden, doing what little good I can in the hope that one day I will find redemption. Now, if you'll excuse me, my walkie-talkie is buzzing, and I must go to work. Everybody watched her dance. Girls and guys alike just couldn't seem to break away from her hypnotic sway. The girl had just walked into the bar, gone straight to the middle of the room, and started dancing. And just like that, we were all under her spell. Had I known then what I know now, I would have turned and ran as fast as I could. I would have tried anyway. It's hard to describe, but just one look at the girl was enough to ensnare you. She was perfect. Waist-length red hair, milky skin, and eyes that burned into your soul. The first guy plucked up the courage to try his luck. He was without a doubt the best-looking man in the room, and he knew it too. He walked over to her and opened his mouth to say something. She put a finger to his lips before any words could escape them, smiled, and shook her head. Something about the way that she turned him down hit me like a mace to the stomach. It was without a doubt the most brutal thing that I'd seen. She didn't insult him, didn't laugh in his face, or throw a drink over him. She let him know, without saying a word, that she would never deign to let him so much as speak to her. Other men and women approached her over the course of the evening. And every one of them, and every one of them left dejected. They were lucky. I never thought I'd stand a chance. After seeing the people she'd already turned away, what hope did a chubby, short, 19-year-old geek have? Better to preserve what dignity I had and sit my drink alone. When she pointed at me and beckoned me to join her, I felt as though I were in a dream. I have to admit that, despite being sat in the corner of the room. I actually looked behind me to see if she was maybe pointing at somebody else, but nope. She wanted me. I froze. There wasn't enough alcohol in the world to give me the courage to dance with her. She laughed and danced her way over to me, and a moment later, she took my hand in hers and kissed me full on the lips. That kiss, God. It was like nothing that I'd ever experienced better than sex. It went hellfire coursing through my brain and sent every nerve ending ablaze. Every forbidden, perverted thought that I'd ever had came rushing through my consciousness. I felt proud to be an animal, a creature whose instincts compelled it to lust and violence. Nothing was beyond me. I could do whatever I wanted to whoever I wanted. And then it was over. Humanity came flooding back and the reality of social norms, ethics, and morality asserted themselves and I remembered who I was. A chubby, short, 19-year-old geek who had no business thinking and feeling the way that I had. That wasn't who I was. You bet it was who I wanted to be, though. Deep down, in that place where senses give way to desire, that was what I wanted. I think that she could sense that. I think that's why she picked me. It's a rush, isn't it? She said. Getting a taste of the beast within is always a rush. I stammered something incomprehensible. My head was still reeling from the kiss. She smiled in like a rat, staring into the eyes of a viper. Give me your number. Um, sure. I managed. Do you want me to text it to you? Uh, do you have a phone? Do you have, do, 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 do you have your phone with you? Um... I could write it down if you prefer. Uh, do you have a pen? She held up a hand before I could continue rambling. Just tell me your phone number. I have an excellent memory. I did as I was told. I'll see you again soon. And with that, she left. I spent the next three days in agony. I couldn't get that kiss out of my mind. The way that I felt left me ashamed and aroused in equal measure. I spent every waking moment replaying the scenario in my head, 
trying to get another taste of how it had wakened some primal creature within me. And every night, I dreamed of that girl. She had my number, but hadn't given me hers. Looking back on it, it's amazing just how much power that gives over a person. Would she call back? Would I ever see her again? Was it all just a cruel prank? And when she finally did call, my phone didn't display her number. But I recognized her voice instantly, though. Her words like a poison dripping into honey. Meet me at the bank in an hour. I didn't even have time to ask which bank she meant. The powerlessness of my situation began to dawn on me. I couldn't just refuse to go. I might never have a chance for another kiss. She had me well and truly dangling on her hook. And in the end, I set off for the closest bank to my house. And sure enough, she appeared exactly one hour after she hung up the phone. I realized how this sounds now that I'm writing it down. I'm sure some of you are thinking, fuck that, I'd run. And that's exactly what I should have done. I couldn't do it though. All it took was one kiss to make me an addict. I, I said as she approached, I've been thinking a lot about you. Um, I wondered if maybe you wanted to get a coffee or something. I don't drink coffee. Oh, uh, okay. Um, maybe a bite to eat? No, thanks. How much do you have in savings? And I blinked. Uh, not much. A, a couple hundred pounds. Perfect. You can make an ATM withdrawal. Not as many questions that way. You want my savings? I said in half a question, half a statement. I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. That depends. Do you want another kiss? As soon as that thought entered my head, my body rebelled. My skin itched and my palms started to sweat. I gritted my teeth against a sudden rush of pain in my stomach. Money wasn't everything. Another kiss was worth it. And so I withdrew the cash. Good dog. She said, leaned in, and kissed me. It wasn't as good as the first time. The first time, I'd never experienced anything so intensely pleasurable. Even so, the feeling of power and virality I'd been trying in vain to remember flooded me once more. All those dark little thoughts and urges resurfaced and I knew there was nothing bad or wrong about them. Humans are animals. Animals fight and fuck. And also rape and kill. The sensation receded, leaving me feeling confused, guilty, and turned on. I opened my eyes, and she was gone. You know you can tell me anything, don't you? Since my dad passed away, Mom had been trying to be extra motherly to me and my sister. Fully cooked breakfasts, family board game nights, the works. She looked at me with deep and genuine concern. I'm fine, I lied. Just, um, flu or something. It had been three weeks since my last kiss, and nothing else mattered. No food, no sleep, not even family. My whole body ached with the need for another kiss. My skin crawled as though instincts were burrowed beneath it, and every time I drifted into unconsciousness, my dreams were full of monsters and suffering. I roll over in bed. I didn't want to look at my mom. I couldn't face her. I love you, Jason. I didn't reply. My bedroom door shut and my mom's footsteps faded away, and I heard a faint sob, and I screwed my eyes shut and tried not to think about my last kiss. But it was impossible. I may as well have tried not to breathe at all. It's drugs, isn't it? My sister said. I hadn't heard her come in. No, Alex, it's not drugs. Bullshit. I sighed, rolling over and looked her straight in the eye. It's not drugs. Right. Okay, then. Let's pretend I believe you. If it's not drugs, what is it? It sure as hell isn't flu. A girl. A girl? Jason, you're a mess. You don't eat, you don't talk, you just stay in your room and lie on your bed. I get that love can be rough, but come on. I don't love her. 
What? I said I don't love her. I fucking hate that bitch, okay? Alex took a step back. I hadn't realized I'd been shouting. I sighed. It felt good to tell the truth. Even if it was only a partial truth. I didn't hate the girl who kissed me. I hated her for what she had done to me. I hated her for not calling me in three torturous weeks. I hated her because I so badly wanted another kiss. What's her name? Whatever she did to you, I'll knock her out for it. I don't know her name. And just then my phone buzzed. Meet me at my house. I'll text you the address. That was her, wasn't it? Alex said. No. Don't lie. Where are you going? Out. I pushed my way past her. She grabbed me by the shoulder and spanned me around. And I was almost ready to hit her until I saw the dampness in her eyes. Please don't go to her. I shook her hand off my shoulder. I wanted to hug her. To apologize to her. But I was too ashamed. And with my head down and tears running down my face. I left. The girl's house was on the outskirts of town, where the city started to give way to countryside. To call the building a house would be like calling the works of Salvador Dali doodles. The thing was a mansion, secured behind enormous walls, troping with viciously barbed iron railings. As soon as I approached, the gate opened for me, allowing me into a driveway the size of a small street. As I walked towards the front door, I took a moment to look at the garden. I didn't recognize most of the flowers, but I knew foxgloves and nightshades when I saw them. Beautiful, deadly flowers. Here and there, the garden was studded with marble sculptures, each one depicting a naked person in agony. There were men impaled by spikes or being set on by slavering wolves. Women wept as their bodies were engulfed in sculptured flame. She stepped out of the front door, her face split by a cruel sneer. I want you to give me a present, she said in a sing-song voice. Her hands were held behind her back. What do you want? I asked. It intended to come out as a hiss. I wanted to show her that I still had some power over myself, but instead, words came out in a whimper. Nails. Nails, I repeated. My thoughts turned to the marble sculptures and the tortures a little bit of sharp metal could inflict. What do you want nails for? I want your nails. Oh. Okay. I was suddenly relieved. Whatever. Uh, do you have scissors? <laughs> she laughed and shook her head. And from behind her back, she produced a pair of pliers. No. I whispered. Yes. Not like that. Please. Not like that. She pouted and held the pliers out to me. No nails. No kiss. I swallowed back a sob. I could already feel my heart beating out a manic drum roll. The thoughts of what I had to do knocked me sick. The thoughts of not getting any other kiss was like having red-hot needles pushed into every pore. And so I took the pliers. And for a long while I stood there, just looking at my hands. My consciousness seemed to be coming from somewhere else, as though I was watching my own body from another plane of existence. I closed the pliers on the nail of my left thumb and started pulling. The pain was unbearable. I watched through tear-blurred eyes as millimeter by millimeter, a red line grew at the base of my nail. My fist clenched around the pliers and pulled with all my strength, screaming with agony as I did. The nail moved less than a centimeter. I wouldn't be able to pull it off in one go. That's it. She crooned. Just ease it out. Don't worry, it'll grow back. Minutes crawled by like hours. I screamed until I could only choke. And with one last pull, the nail came free. My hands shaking and wet with blood and sweat. I pulled my thumbnail into a cupped hand. And despite the snot dribbling down my face, I leaned in for a kiss. But she backed away. No, no, no. That's no good. I gave you my fucking nail, I cried. I hated her more than I thought was possible. I said I wanted nails, plural. You have another thumb and eight fingers to go yet. 
I pulled at my hair, wailing with frustration and pain and anger. She stepped forward and tussled my hair. Aw, poor little doggy doesn't want his kiss. I made a grab for her. If she wouldn't give me a kiss, then I would just take one from her. And the moment my hands touched her, something like an electric shock passed through my hands and burned its way down to my feet. Searing agony knocked me to the floor. It took me a good 15 seconds before I could breathe again. Just for that, I'll have your toenails as well. Three months passed with no call. My last kiss had barely been enough to take the edge off the pain. As you might expect, my mother and sister were horrified when they found out what I'd done to my fingers and toes. They phoned the police straight away. I told the officer what I could. The description I gave could have matched any number of women. My phone had no sign of any stranger's calls or texts, and the address I told them about had revealed nothing but an empty feel. None of that came as a surprise to me. I was pretty sure that I'd gone beyond the point where I could be shocked. Whoever the girl who kissed me was, I was certain that she wasn't truly human. My drug tests came back negative, eliminating my family's theory that I'd started taking heroin or something. And with the negative tests, the police quickly lost interest. They saw no reason to suspect that I was being abused by my family and passed me over to the care of a psychiatrist. Telling the truth didn't make me feel any better, especially since nobody believed me. My sister figured I'd been rejected by a girl and had a breakdown. My psychiatrist was certain that my so-called succubus was entirely a creation of a disturbed mind. He theorized that the red-headed girl was nothing more than a projection of deep-seated sadomasochistic fantasies. <laughs> I was too preoccupied with my own suffering to pay much attention to the people around me. I shambled through life like a zombie. The physical effects of kiss withdrawal were crippling. My skin itched and burned. It felt like I was being bitten from within by an army of fire ants. Until my nails grew back. I had resorted to scratching myself with a fork, leaving bloody trails behind my arms and chest. My nightmares started to spill over and into my waking life. Here and there, I'd seen something scuttling on the edge of vision. Shadow figures loomed over my bed, reaching out with taloned hands to torment me. I saw maggots in my food and centipedes in my drink. Life had become hell on earth. And then she came back. The knocking woke me up in the middle of the night. Something was pounding on the front door with the force of a battering ram. Mom, the door, I said, still drowsy from the fitful sleep. Ma, Alex, can you see who's out there, please? I swore and stumbled out of bed. I didn't hear any movement from my family, so I slipped on some clothes and went downstairs. I opened the door just as another set of knocks, knocking strong enough to crack the wood, had started. A huge man in a suit stood in the doorway. He had the look of a bouncer or archetypal hired goon. She wants to see you, he said in a voice too gentle for his appearance. I said nothing and looked past him. A black limousine was parked in front of my house, its windows tinted to stop anything looking inside, and I took a step back. Mom? I shouted, panic starting to overwhelm me. Alex! She has them, the man said. He sounded sympathetic. I'm taking you to see them. How? Where? I stammered, my mind struggling to put together a logical explanation for how my family could have been kidnapped without me noticing. But I gave in. Logic didn't apply to that... demon. Come on. It's time to go. The man put a hand on my shoulder and led me towards the car. Partway there, when I'd managed to recover my senses a little, I asked him a question that had plagued me almost as much as my addiction. Who is she? She's... She's the worst thing that has ever happened to me, the man said. He fought back a sob and squeezed my shoulder in an almost fatherly way. Just don't make her angry. Whatever you do. Don't make her angry. 
He opened the back door to the limousine and waited for me to get in before heading over to the driver's seat. She was inside, clad in fur and diamonds like some sort of celebrity. She smiled and pushed a glass of wine in my hand, but I didn't drink it. Let's talk business, she said as the limo started to move. I don't want another kiss. I want my family. Nobody wants another kiss. Not when they think it through rationally, at least. No, this is about craving. You don't want another kiss. You crave it. Deep down, I think you'd do anything for another kiss. Where's my family? They're safe. Not exactly comfortable. But they haven't come to any harm. I relaxed a little. Some instinct told me that whatever she was, she couldn't lie. More precisely, whatever she said just had to be. You're a demon, aren't you? A succubus. She smirked. Poor little doggy. I'm more than a demon. I'm the mother of demons. Consort to the accuser. Queen bitch. So, do you want my soul? I felt my mouth go dry as the words left. It was like waking to find out that the monster from your nightmare was standing by your bed. Clever boy. In return, I'll kiss you once a week. Every week. After three long months of withdrawal, that has to be at least a little tempting, hmm? She was right about that. A kiss every week. I'd already been through hell. My soul couldn't be worth so much. What was damnation compared with a kiss every week? All right. Deal. She purred as I continued to go on. So what do I do? Shake hands, sign my name in blood? No, that won't cut it. You can't just give away your soul. You have to do something to lose it. I felt the limousine slow to a stop. The big man stepped out and opened the door for us. She stepped out first and offered me her hand. And I took it. And we walked across soft, damp grass towards a structure resembling a concrete garden shed. My heart threatened to break through my ribs as we got closer. I saw my family was inside. I knew she wanted me to hurt them and she opened the door. My mother and sister were bound to metal chairs. They'd been gagged and tears streaked down their faces. And when they saw me, they tried to scream their pleas. My heart broke at the sight of them. Something cold and heavy was pressed into my hands. I looked down at the gun and started to weep. I, I can't, I said, turning towards the redhead girl. I can't shoot them. Oh, you poor puppy. She said in a mocking sympathy. The gun isn't for them. It's for you. For me? Yes. It's for if you want to back out of the deal. Put the gun to your head. Pull the trigger. And you have my word I'll let your family go. I didn't have to think about it. I aimed the gun straight at the bitch. And she pulled out a melodramatic face of shock. Oh, Wow. Didn't see that one coming. Here's the thing. If you shoot me, I won't die. I can't die. What I can do is make sure you, your mother, and your horse sister spend many a long year wishing you were dead. I turned the gun away from her and put it to my own head, my hands trembling as I heard my mother wail. Very noble. Sacrifice yourself to save your family better than just walking away and facing a life with no more kisses, right? She put a certain emphasis on the word kisses and the effect was instantaneous. My mind turned straight to the thought of that first kiss. I couldn't shake the memory of how good it was. She cocked her head and sneered. She knew that she had gotten me. Mind you, a kiss a week? Now that could be heaven on earth. It'd be cruel of your family to stand in the way of your happiness, wouldn't it? I sobbed with frustration and shame as I turned the gun towards my mother. I couldn't look at her in the eyes. I tried to ignore her muffled screams as I pulled the trigger. The shot echoed across the countryside. I'd missed. The redhead girl held my wrist, 
pointing the gun a foot above my mother's head. I stared at her in confusion. I told you the gun isn't for them. She hissed. She pried it out of my fingers and dropped it to the floor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all of you. I turned around at the sound of the big man's voice. I looked down at what he was holding and my heart sank. And my family screamed. No, I whispered. Anything but that. If you want your kisses, this is how I want you to surrender your soul. Please, just let me use the gun. No. I took a few trembling steps towards the big man, knowing that I stood on the precipice of damnation, knowing that if I did what she wanted me to do, I deserved to go to hell. But a kiss a week. Every week. I couldn't stop myself from thinking about it. And so I took the kerosene, along with the matches. I woke up in a birthing sack, panicked and choking on amniotic fluid. I clawed at the fleshy walls, fighting with all my terrified strength to free myself. With a wet, ripping sound, I was dumped onto the muddy cobbles of the street below, twisting my ankle as I landed. Cold rain blasted my naked body clean of the sack's liquid. I tried and failed to get to my feet. The street was alien to me. An insane medley of architecture ranging from the modern to the prehistoric. The sky above me boiled with storm clouds, illuminating my surroundings with non-stop flashes of lightning. A man walked over to me. His hair was matted with filth and the rain streaked down his mismatched leather clothes. He said nothing, just watched me squirm on the floor. Please, I gasped, help me. He answered by slamming a foot down on my face breaking my jaw and making my vision real. He moved on to my limbs, stamping and tugging until he heard the bones snap. Crippled, naked, and screaming, there was nothing I could do to defend myself as he started to eat me alive. My introduction to hell wasn't unusual. Very few people survived their first hour let alone their first night. When they die, they go through the same thing again, emerging from a new birthing sack in another part of the city. Eventually, they learn to attack the first person that they see, and if they're lucky, they'll be able to kill that person. That's the one rule of hell. The strong take from the weak. Get used to the idea, and you might just make it through the afterlife. I'm going to give you a helping hand. Consider this your handbook to hell. A primer on the inferno. Make no mistake though, I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my heart. When you die, you'll owe me one. Don't worry about trying to find me. I guarantee that we'll run into each other eventually. Eternity is a long fucking time. So it's a matter of when, rather than if. Do as I tell you, and you'll have a better chance than most of avoiding my own nasty introduction to the pit. Welcome to hell. Some people swear they saw a light at the end of the tunnel when they died. To my mind, those people either hallucinated or they're lying. Most of us just wake up in a birthing sack a few minutes after death. The buildings of hell are covered in the things. Horrible yellow-brown pimples growing out of the brick. I've already mentioned that the first thing that you do is claw your way out and get ready to fight. This is where the real bitch of the situation comes into play, since not everyone has the strength to break through their sack's flesh. You get the body that you had just before you died, see? So, let's just say that you were born a cripple, or maybe you died too young or too old. Well, tough shit. You're going to have a rough eternity drowning in birthing fluid over and over. If you manage to break free of your sack, 
Don't waste time moping around, wondering what the fuck happened. Get on your feet and get ready to defend yourself. Chances are good that the first person who sees you will be hungry. There are no plants or animals in hell. So cannibalism is your only option if you don't fancy starving to death and having to start over. Aim to kill the first person that you see. It might take a few tries. Most of Hell's residents have been fighting for survival a lot longer than you. They might have armor made from tanned skin, scavenged metal and bone. They'll almost certainly have a shiv, club or an axe. All of that will be useful to you if you take it from them. The next thing to do is find shelter. It never stops raining in hell and pneumonia is a shitty way to die. Luckily, you'll have a selection of buildings to choose from. Ever wanted to live in a rundown Victorian manor with half a roof and no furniture? How about an ancient Egyptian mud brick hovel? If people have built it, you can find a crumbling version of it in hell. Pick a building, kill any squatters you find, and move in. The best houses are the ones that come with a supply of scrap metal and timber. Not only are those good for making weapons with, they're also vital for getting drinkable water. I learned the hard way that Hell's rain is teeming with disease. It has to be boiled before it's safe. So getting a fire going and something to make a bowl with is a necessity. So, we've killed your first man and found a home. Things are going well. Get that far and you're going to want to hang on to whatever it is that you have forever. But you won't. Something will kill you eventually and you'll have to start over. My record is a year. If you want to beat that, you'll need to understand hell as well as its denizens. The Damned The people of hell can be grouped into two categories. The first, the fresh meat, are those who've just climbed out of their birthing sack. It's kill or be killed when it comes to fresh meat. Always has been. The newly birthed want clothing and tools and will kill you to get a hold of them. The second category, the residents, view fresh meat as a quick and easy supply of food, leather and bone. Residents have an easier time of it for sure and all of them will fight to retain their resident status for as long as they can. Make no mistake though, residents victimize each other just as much as they prey on the fresh meat. If you're a woman for instance, well... You better get used to any hang-ups that you have about rape. Women get raped in hell far more than men. It's just a fact. If you're one of those bodybuilders or warrior women, do the smart thing and prostitute yourself for protection. Self-respect doesn't keep you breathing. Remember how you get the body that you had just before you died? Well, that fact forms the core of hell's society. The truth of the matter is that throughout history, it's usually been men who die in battle. That means in hell, there are a lot of men with young, strong, fit bodies for war. Don't like it? Tough. Those are the guys who call the shots. If you can't fight them, you better do as they say. If you live long enough to fight well enough, you might get invited into one of the resident tribes. These are groups of people who have banded together for the sake of safety and numbers. Believe me, being part of a group makes things a lot easier in hell. However, keep in mind that you're only part of the tribe for as long as you're a resident. Get yourself killed and it's back to being fresh meat. Tribes offer the closest thing to civilized society that you'll find in hell. If you're part of a tribe, you have people on your side who probably won't kill you unless shit gets rough. It doesn't sound like much, but that's as good as it gets. My own survival record was thanks to getting into a tribe. Life was good for a while there. We had about 50 soldiers and plenty of girls to fuck. Nobody could touch us and the men abided by an honor code. So the usual fear of being stabbed in the back by our friends wasn't too much of an issue. I could have spent my eternity in reasonable comfort, but hell has many ways of fucking over a good thing. Human flesh and boiled rainwater doesn't exactly make for a balanced diet. And sooner or later, even the strongest residents die of malnutrition. I did well to last a year on it, though the last few months were agony. If I believed in God, 
I'd swear he designed hell in such a way that nobody stays on top of the food chain for very long. The city and the wasteland. Most of the damned live in Dis, the city of hell. That's where all the fresh meat is born and consider the size of the place coupled with the short life expectancy. A lot of people will spend eternity without ever having set foot outside of Dis. Take my advice. Do not leave the city. Things are rough on the streets, and that's true. But trust me when I say it gets a whole lot worse if you try to leave. Dis is surrounded by a wasteland called Gehana. At first glance, it doesn't look like much. Just an empty expanse of gray stretching out into infinity. Sometimes the damned lose that fire in their belly. The will to survive. And set off wandering into Gehana. Most of them never come back. I made the walk myself once, a long time ago. I don't care how hard you think you are. Spend enough time in hell and it starts to break you down. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm a good person for whoever deserves this. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm a good person who never deserved this. Nobody can say that and not be a liar. I'm not evil though. Or rather, that wasn't. Not until I got to hell. You murder, rape, and torture because you know they will do the same thing to you. You're murdered, raped, and tortured because they know you'll do the same thing to them. Give it long enough and you just don't want to face it anymore. That's when you take the walk into Kahana. The first couple of miles I walked were nothing special. The rain stopped after a while and the sludge beneath my feet giving way to gray ash and I caught my first glimpse of hell's sky beyond the clouds. It was a flat gray with a white sun, completely devoid of beauty or warmth, but I trudged on. While walking through Gahana, I lost any urge to eat, drink, or sleep. My body started to waste away, but I didn't care. Even when my skin started to peel away and my bones were exposed, I still didn't care. The further I walked, the hollower I became in mind, body, and soul. I don't know what would have happened if I'd kept going. Frankly, I don't want to know. Some part of me still wanted to live, so I turned back. I'd walked for days, maybe weeks. Yet when I turned around, this was only a few steps away. I stepped back into the city and my body finally fell apart. When I emerged from my birthing sack, I swore never to step foot into Gahana again, escaping from hell. There are ways to leave hell. That should be obvious. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you, would I? Sometimes the living get it into their heads that they want to talk with the dead. They get their crystals, incense, and spirit boards in the hopes of reaching their loved ones. Most do nothing more than trick themselves into thinking that they've made contact. They smile or cry, convinced that their beloved granny is playing the harp on a cloud somewhere before getting on with their lives. A few have the skill to actually reach us, though. They can open a gate between hell and the world of the living that we perceive as a pillar of fire stretching down from the clouds. As soon as one of those pillars show up, the damned scramble to be the first to get to it. You haven't seen the true nature of man until you've watched thousands of the damned swarming over each other, kicking, biting, clawing to be the one who escapes. Contacting the dead always results in a bloodbath. Even the most civilized tribes fall apart the instant that it becomes clear that only one of them can leave. I've left hell twice now, left my body behind and ridden that pillar of fire up into the clouds. Some people believe that you can be possessed by demons. Let me tell you something. Demons are not real. What the living sees as demonic possession is just one of the damned testing out their new body. Let's face it. If you fought your way through hell to get back to the world of the living, you're not going to be on your best behavior for very long. Sooner or later, we take things too far. Our host dies or their family cave and recruit an exorcist. Then we're fresh out of the birthing sack and on the streets again. I'm going to go on now. 
when you get to hell, remember my advice and that you owe me one. Maybe one day we can form a tribe. Someday. For the time being, though, I want to see what my new body can do. By now, you should have a good idea of what you can expect from hell. You know to kill the first person you see when you fight your way out of the birthing sack. You know to find clothing and tools and shelter. You know that no matter what you will do, how well you do, someday it's back to being the fresh meat. This is the biggest city you can imagine. Tribes fight and die for territory and taking a wrong turn is a fucking death sentence. You'll get a feel for where you should be going and shouldn't go eventually. Develop the kind of street smarts you need to stay a resident for more than a day. Even so, there are places in Dis that you should know about. Let's do a little sightseeing tour of hell. Maybe the advance warning will do some good for you. Skin Street. Allow me to tell you about the first time that I saw Skin Street. I dropped out of my birthing sack onto the road, stood straight back up and got myself ready to fight. But nobody was there. Not one single person was out on the street that stretched for miles in either direction. I relaxed a little and took a look around. Most of the streets in Dis are a labyrinth network of buildings. You spend most of your stay in hell paranoid that, just around the next corner, there's someone ready to beat you down. Skin Street isn't like that. It's a single, straight line with only the rain and the darkness to hamper visibility. I felt more vulnerable there than I felt in any parts of Dis. You ever walked into a wide, empty space and suddenly felt exposed? Yeah. Imagine also being naked, unarmed, and in hell. Still, I know what I was supposed to do. The first step was to find some clothing. And that's where I learned how Skin Street got its name. Every building, every busted street light and gas lamp was decorated with flayed skin. I'd been in hell long enough by that point to not be too freaked out, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't affect me. In a fucked up kind of way, it reminded me of Christmas, you know? People hanging wreaths and lights from their houses, that sort of thing. I remembered the time I'd spent with my family, with my kids on Christmas morning. Feelings like that will get you killed. I pushed them back down and pulled some scraps from the nearest building. If somebody was going to leave clothing material lying about, I may as well take it, right? I didn't know it at the time, but every step I took on Skin Street was being watched. When the attack came, I didn't even get a glimpse of the guy. My skull fractured from an expert swing of a club. Whoever hit me went for my eyes and the second I hit the floor, stuck his fingers right into my sockets. I was blind and crying like a baby when he started to peel away my skin. Here's the thing. Some people are fucked up even by hell's standards. The loners, serial killers, stalkers, and psychopaths all make their way to Skin Street in the end. Most of the damned use the whole body of a kill, but the Skin Street people like to take trophies. They leave their ornaments out as bait for the ignorant, skulking in the shadows and watching for the best moment to ambush. If you find yourself on Skin Street, you're going to have to think fast. Forget clothing, just grab a rock piece of wood or anything else you can as a weapon. Stay out of the shadows. Keep checking behind you. And get out of there as quickly as you can. The Perdition Farms. You're going to be chased in hell. That's unavoidable. At some point you'll stumble into somebody bigger than you and you'll find yourself outnumbered. Forget about a fair fight. If somebody can take you down without you fighting back, you bet that that's what they'll do. It's easy to lose focus when you're running for your life. You can forget to pay attention to your surroundings. And that, my friend, is a big mistake. The outskirts of the Perdition Farms are littered with billboards. They promise free food and safety to anybody fucking stupid enough to believe them. The tribes that fight over that particular territory like to herd people off the streets and into the industrial complex they call home. The good news is that those tribes 
will not kill you. The bad news is that they're big fans of taking people alive. They've got a project, you see. Been working on it for as long as I can remember. I couldn't tell you who originally decided that Hell should have organized food production, only that the idea stuck, and that over the years, countless tribes have taken it upon themselves to try and make that dream a reality. Get yourself captured by them, and you can look forward to a bit of slave labor. For the most part, the Perdition farm tribes try to make use of the birthing pods as a resource of food. They force their slaves to harvest them from the walls, grind them up into industrial vats, mix them with blood, body parts, rainwater, and anything else that they can conceivably make a broth. The life of a slave is short, brutal, and disgusting. Particularly when those slaves are then used as guinea pigs for the latest concoction. You see, amniotic fluid can be drunk if you're desperate. Though drinking too much is guaranteed to make you empty your stomach from every available orifice. The flesh of the sacks is a different matter, though. I couldn't tell you exactly what the birthing sacks are. Some people say that they're actual flesh, while others swear that they're more like a fungus. What I do know is that they repair themselves over time, eat some of their flesh, and over the next few days, you'll grow a new birthing sack inside of you. It's a small mercy that you won't live long enough to see it break through your skin. You'll be dead shortly after your stomach bursts. If you're lucky, your days as a slave will end when the tribe decides that they want some real meat. They're not stupid enough to test their broth themselves. Not when there's a shortage of slaves in hell. Look, I can't force you to stay out of the perdition farms. I can only offer advice. In my opinion, if you think that you are being herded there, it's better to take whatever's to hand and cut your own throat. I'd take fresh meat status a hundred times before spending another day on the farms. The Boneyard. So maybe you're thinking to yourself, hey, I'm a kind of nut job who'd join a cult. Is there anything in hell for me? That sounds like you. The Boneyard has you covered. You see, there's a certain kind of religious fanatic who really does belong in hell. I'm not talking about the old deers who bake cakes to raise money for the new church roof here. I'm talking about the guys who went to war because God commanded it, who burned women for supposedly consorting with demons and who saw nothing wrong with fucking the odd kid. When those people get to hell, they're too thick-headed to make sense of what happened. Why face reality when you can pretend it's all just a test of faith? They'll find like-minded folk in the Boneyard. I'm told at one point, the Boneyard was a cathedral surrounded by a cemetery that stretched from horizon to horizon. Maybe that's true. I don't know. These days, it's a shanty town of temples and churches built from materials scavenged from the streets. Everywhere you look, you'll find wild-eyed zealots preaching their own twisted version of redemption and gangs of masked men on the prowl for fresh converts. Mortification of the flesh is the main pastime in the boneyard. If you listen to the cacophony of sermons, you'll be informed on how the flesh is wicked and must be purged of sin. How lucky we are to be given such a holy duty. How fortunate to be given the opportunity to redeem ourselves before God. The people of the boneyard have had a long time and plenty of fucking practice when it comes to mastering torture and degradation. Now, I'm not a good person. I've killed, raped, and cannibalized, but I can honestly tell you I'd never been able to dream up some of the shit that goes on in the boneyard. I wandered in there by accident once, and I've never been able to get what I saw out of my brain. I watched a woman, naked and bound, forced onto her knees and violated with iron rods. A preacher sewed his own eyes and lips shut in front of the crowd before sawing off his manhood with a piece of slate. A boy, maybe 14, was publicly crucified, and a girl was drowned in shit. An older man had sharpened flint pushed under his fingernails. I couldn't list off a hundred other atrocities done in the name of redemption. 
Stay away from the Boneyard. The people there decide that hell just isn't hellish enough for their liking. Forget about redemption. Forget about God. The only way out of hell is by riding a pillar of fire and taking over a living body. Focus on that if you want to escape. The damned can't offer you salvation. The damned only offer pain. I have to leave you soon. If I'm to make the most out of life on Earth, I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip town. While I've had plenty to keep myself entertained, this body just isn't suitable for a run-in with the police. It's only a matter of time until some nosy neighbor thinks to pick up the phone. With the humidity over the last few days, Mummy and Daddy are already pretty ripe. Here's something you have to understand. Hell is a big place. I've given you fair warning about a few of the locations I myself have run into and that will have to do. Even if I wrote a library's worth of novels solely dedicated to mapping out the distinct locations within Dis, I still couldn't tell you everything about the city. What I can do is give you a bit of information about some of the damned. The Slaughter Man. Take a moment to think about all of the celebrities you know. How many of them do you reckon would do well in Dis? Not many, I'll wager. Perhaps none. Fame and fortune on Earth doesn't count for shit when you're dead. Very few people are strong enough, mean enough, and downright psychotic enough to earn a reputation in hell. Those few who have what it takes are people you never want to meet. The Slaughter Man is one of hell's legends. A huge, bearded man with filed teeth, bloodshot eyes, and foam on his lips. Rumor has it that the day that he first emerged from a birthing sack, he was unlucky enough to land on the feet of a slaver tribe. Well, those tribesmen chuckled to themselves and readied their clubs and whips, all too happy to take some fresh meat captive. Outnumbered a dozen to one, naked and unarmed and brand new to hell, most people wouldn't stand a chance. If you believe the stories, the slaughter man shrugged off the clubs battering against him and the whips cutting into his flesh as though they were just insect bites. He picked up the first slaver, put his hand into the man's mouth and pulled his jaw right off of his skull. He moved on to another, and then another, tearing them apart with his bare hands until the survivors turned and fled. Nobody knows for sure who he was in life. I've heard theories though, and the most popular one being that he was a berserker of Stamford Bridge. Supposedly, a single Viking held up the English army single-handed. It didn't matter that he could never win, that he was outnumbered, that his enemies had better weapons and armor. He stood on the bridge and he fought. By the time that he was brought down, he'd killed no less than 40 men. I don't know how true any of this is. I've never seen the Slaughter Man for myself and I don't fucking want to. What I can tell you for sure is that people don't become legendary in hell without good reason. I'd guess that the only one who knows the truth is the Slaughter Man himself, and he isn't saying anything. Since the day he arrived in hell, he's only spoken once. The fleeing slavers heard it as the Slaughter Man tore their tribe apart. Naked, bloody, and surrounded by corpses, the Slaughter Man looked up to the storm wracked sky and bellowed a single word. Hellhounds. How about a little story? I wasn't new to hell. I had made myself some clothes and a wooden club, found shelter, and had a big slab of meat roasting over a campfire. The only thing I didn't have was a tribe. The area I'd been birthed in seemed slummy even for Dis. All half-collapsed hovels and mud huts. Iron was scarce, barely enough to make myself a water bowl. All in all, not a good spot for a tribe. My plan was simple enough, though. I'd have a decent meal, carve myself a shiver or two in case I lost my club, then find somewhere more or less dry to sleep. After that, I'd set off to look for a tribe. 
Even the mildest tribal initiations result in a few scars and a broken nose, so I wanted to be at least well rested as much as I could be. Sleep in hell is both vital and dangerous. There's an act of finding somewhere that's simultaneously sheltered, hidden, and with access to an escape route. Even then, you never get more than a few hours at a time. In hell, the slightest suspicious noise should scare the shit out of you. A low, throaty growl definitely counts as a suspicious noise. I leapt out of my impromptu nest of skins and wood, raised my club, and returned the growl with one of my own. A woman had crept into my building and was staring at me with dilated pupils. She looked to be in a bad way, skinny, naked, and covered in weeping sores. Her lips peeled back to reveal broken and jagged teeth. It took me only a second to size her up. She'd been living rough for a few days, or maybe even weeks. Judging from her protruding ribs and bloated stomach, she was well on her way to dying of starvation. So, she was weak, hungry, and didn't even have a weapon. I've already eaten, I said, relaxing a little and giving my club a few practice swings. No sense in letting you go to waste, though. I took a step towards her and she bolted, just turned right around and scampered away into a strange animal gate. I took off after her, certain that I would outpace her. Even if there wasn't much meat on her, bones can still be useful. I chased her through a few streets, struggling to keep my footing on the muddy ground. When I finally got close enough to swing my club, she stopped dead. The suddenness of it caught me off guard and I tripped over her, losing my club as I fell. She howled in triumph, a sound that was echoed by a dozen other throats. That day, I learned two things about the hellhounds. Those people who lose their minds and become little more than beasts after enduring centuries in hell. Firstly, they have the necessary animal cunning to hunt as a pack. Secondly, human teeth and fingernails are perfectly capable of ripping flesh from the bone. The surgeons. Modern doctors rarely thrive in hell. Academia and reliance on technology don't leave you in the best state to endure the endless violence and brutality. There are exceptions, though. The people who learned to sew their friends back together amid the machine gun fire of the Samma. Shamans, witch doctors, and holy men who endured famine and warfare. Survivalists who learned how to cauterize their own wounds in the middle of a forest. Those are some of the people who might just be strong enough to plead their trade to the damned. After all, working knowledge of basic medicine is just one of the things that's beyond a lot of the meatheads roaming dis. Most of Hell's surgeons find a tribe as soon as they're able. Their tools might be crude, but they soon learn how to make do. Flint, slate, and shards of glass serve as their scalpels. They make thread from human hair and needles from slivers of iron. Whenever a member of the tribe has an infected sore, a surgeon will be the one to drain the pus. A tribal surgeon could well save your life, but they'll do it without any anesthetic. Then there are the freelance surgeons, the people who try to go it alone. They make themselves a uniform, the theory being that the damned will recognize them if they all look alike. It doesn't really work, but you can't expect much logic from people who've lost count of how many times they've died. For one thing, fashions change over time. I'm told that freelancers wore headdresses and bone necklaces at one point. The current trend is to mimic Venetian plague doctors by donning a beaked mask and wearing a long coat of fire-blackened skin. Freelancers are rare. Very rare, in fact. You'll see thousands of the damned for every freelance surgeon you come across. When you do come across one, be fucking careful. Firstly, surgeons don't get a free pass in hell. The damned are more likely to attack a freelancer than they are to barter their tools, clothes, and slaves in exchange for his services. You also can't be certain that if the man in the bird mask and black coat is really a surgeon, or somebody who murdered a surgeon and took his clothes. 
Perhaps they made the outfit themselves in order to draw the weak and wounded close. Advertising doesn't always work as intended in dis. If the freelancer turns out to be genuine, that doesn't give you an excuse to drop your guard. Freelance surgeons aren't usually the most stable people. Put it another way, freelancers are usually sadistic fucking psychopaths. Sure, they might stitch you back together and send you on your way. They might also decide it would be more interesting if they stitch you to someone else. They might think that paying an arm and a leg for their services should be taken literally. They might turn out to be some wannabe serial killer who's yet to find their way to Skin Street. For each freelancer trying to do a tough job in a tougher place, there are a dozen or so mangles who want to try out their toys on somebody too injured to fight back. Stick with your tribe surgeon if you're lucky enough to have one. Failing that, learn to patch up your own wounds. Trust me, if you're able to read, you've already got the intellectual advantage over a lot of Hell's residents. Universal education is pretty recent. Freelancers aren't worth the risk. Cambians. I'll be honest with you here. I don't know if Cambians actually exist. What I'm going to tell you is something that somebody else told me. It's up to you to decide if that's true or not. Personally, I really fucking hope it isn't. People rape one another in hell. It happens a lot. If you're not strong enough, it'll happen to you. The good news for the ladies out there is that damned men fire blanks. You'll almost never be impregnated. Now, I say almost never, because if you believe the stories, there's an incredibly slim chance that a couple of those little swimmers will be awake and looking for an egg. Just to put this into perspective, we're talking conjoined twins level of unlikeliness here, and that's just conception. The chances of a pregnant woman surviving the full nine months in hell are probably conjoined triplets level of unlikely. You're talking about the perfect storm of beating the odds here. But this is eternity. A monkey randomly smashing keys on a typewriter will eventually produce the complete works of Shakespeare if it goes on for an eternity. The results of that perfect storm, of those monkeys with the typewriters, is a cambion. A child conceived and born in hell. I'm not saying they exist, okay? I'm just saying I've met somebody who swears it's true and that he's seen a cambion for himself. You see babies in their birthing sacks from time to time. Usually it's just a body. Occasionally, you see one drowning. Most of the time, damned ignore them. They wouldn't survive a day on the streets even if you could afford to devote your full attention to them. Better to leave them be. It's only the really fucked up people who cut through the sacks and... Yeah. I'm not going to finish that thought. I'm getting a little sidetracked. Um, So, this Cambian, who may or may not exist, apparently looked like a normal child. It cried, it shit, it sucked its mother's tits just like a regular baby would. The mother was part of a tribe and they'd been able to protect her throughout her pregnancy. Couldn't tell you why. Maybe curiosity, perhaps? When it was born, the whole tribe gathered around to have a look. Among them was the man who told me this story. Somebody I'd met years later and eventually would kill. This man cut the baby's cord and lifted it up to his face. Every man in the tribe had raped the mother at one point or another, and he wanted to see if the child looked anything like him. The Cambian looked like a normal child in every way but one. Its eyes were dead, lifeless, like a doll's. Sure, the kid was alive. It wriggled and cried like a normal baby. Those eyes were wide open, though, not scrunched closed like a newborn's eyes should be. Wide open, empty, doll's eyes. If that story is true, I don't blame the tribe for killing the child. Something like that should never exist. So with that, I am done. And I have to go. This is the point where people like to have things nicely tied up. A few dragons slain, a few maidens served. At the very least, 
you could expect some kind of moral lesson to think over. I think that, in this case, that sort of thing is missing the point. There are no dragons to slay, no morals to learn. We do not live happily ever after. There's no grand revelation, no clever twist, no purpose, no redemption, no hope. There's only eternity among our own kind. Well, hey, it's been a long time. The last body I had in the living world didn't cope too well with my mind driving it. It's sometimes hard to remember that the lessons you learn in hell aren't a good fit for the civilized world. When murder is just a normal part of existence, you tend to keep doing it out of habit. The inevitable result is either death or exorcism and a trip back to the city of Dis. Safe to say, I got a bit carried away the last time that I was here. After my last taste of freedom, I knew that I had to get back out of Dis. My existence ever since I squandered my last host has been utterly dedicated to finding my way back into a pillar of fire. I had to escape Dis. After what I've seen, I had to escape. This new body seems a little bit more durable than the last one. Now that I'm back, shall we take another trip to hell? Flagathan Swamp. It rains in hell. It rains all the fucking time and the waters have to go somewhere. Most of it drains into Gahana where it sinks into the otherworldly ash and apparently disappears. The rest flows either into the sewers beneath the city or collects into Flagathan Swamp. Remember how it is a bad idea to drink the rainwater in hell without boiling it? Well, the swamp water will kill you no matter what you do with it. Even letting the stuff touch your skin can be deadly. You see, the swamp isn't just filled with disease and rot. It's also brimming with chemical waste. One pool might simply be undrinkable, but another might dissolve your flesh. If you're mad enough to travel to Phlegathen, or unlikely enough to be born there, your odds of survival are slim. Phlegathen's waters are inky black, and it's impossible to tell just how deep the pool is by looking. It could be an inch or it could be a mile. You never know whether or not your next footfall will plunge you into the cloying abyss. More still, there are places where the sewers gradually drain the water and create unseen vortices capable of dragging down even the strongest of the damned. To navigate the swamp, you're better off using the crumbled buildings as stepping stones. The corrosive water causes wooden supports to wither and collapse, so there's plenty of debris lying around to stand on. Even so, if you take it slow and keep your balance, it's easy to slip and subject yourself to a fucking agonizing death. Last but not least are the wildfires. These are the reason that even the most insane tribes don't even try to establish a permanent stronghold in Flagrath and Swamp. All that chemical waste and decaying matter makes the swamp extremely volatile. A lightning strike or buildup of gases can result in an immense explosion that ignites Flagrathan's surface for miles around. Wildfires move fast. I guarantee that you won't outrun one. Kakaitis. The first time that you see Kakaitis, you could be forgiven for thinking you'd reach the very edge of Dis. The pit is dozens of miles wide and several times as deep. At some point in the dim and distant past, a fragile alliance of tribes put their slaves to work digging a quarry. Why they did this is lost to time, but many believe it was an attempt to escape Dis. Perhaps those tribes hoped that, if they dug far enough, they'd eventually tunnel their way out of hell. In my view, the more likely answer is that those tribes were looking for resources. If that's true, then the evacuation was a success. Miles below the surface, beneath the rock and dirt, there are caverns filled with veins of iron and copper. So far underground and sheltered from the relentless fucking rain, it's far easier to create a fire hot enough to smelt ore. 
the value of such a position wasn't lost on the tribes, and that alliance soon showed just how brittle it was. After a short but savage burst of treachery, the initial shelters of Kakaitis all but wiped themselves out. Since then, the pit has been settled and mined countless times. Coordinated efforts from various tribes have transformed the quarry into an abyss. So far, these alliances have always been broken sooner or later. Kakaitis has many paths into its depths and the lower you go, the more labyrinth the pit becomes. The sprawling caverns shelter entire shanty towns and crude smelting facilities. Some are abandoned, others have been lost to cave-ins. Yet there are still plenty of tribes who fight, join forces, and betray each other over the precious ore veins. By this point, you have to go pretty fucking deep to find an untapped vein, and this is where Kakaitis becomes truly deadly. Anybody who thought they might be able to tunnel out of hell would be sorely disappointed once they learn what lies in the depths. In all these years, after digging for so many miles, not one person has run into some magical portal leading out of Dis. They also haven't run into magma for the matter. Instead, the deeper you go, the colder Okaitis becomes. I've never been to the very bottom myself. I'm told that down there, the air is cold enough to freeze your blood and shatter your skin. Maybe that's true. I could certainly believe it. On the rare occasion I've seen Kokaitis, I've also had to turn back once the walls became more ice than rock, and the narrow walkway became a death trap. If you have the numbers to do it, Kokaitis is still a valuable place to settle. Just remember that when hunger, cold, and greed are your constant companions, None of the damned can be trusted. The Pale Witch I've told you about the Slaughter Man previously, but Hell has other legendary figures, each with their own sebroquets. The Ripper, the Grim Doctor, the Tyrant, and many more. So far, I've only encountered one of these figures. During my last stay in Hell, I came across the Pale Witch. As is always the case with legends, the truth about the Pale Witch tends to get lost amid superstition. I've heard plenty of theories as to what she is. The Pale Witch is a Striga who has the power of the evil eye. The Pale Witch is a Gorgon whose gaze turns her victims to stone. The Pale Witch is a succubus who entraps the minds of those she wishes to consume. All of that is bullshit. I've seen the Pale Witch. And I know the truth about her. When I first saw her, I didn't realize who I was looking at. She was naked and locked in combat with an armed resident, so I took her for fresh meat. Here's a tip for you. If you see a resident fighting fresh meat, kill both of them while they're distracted. I planned to do exactly that, but something about the fight seemed off. Residents usually have the upper hand in a fight against fresh meat, and this particular bout definitely seemed about as one-sided as it gets. She was naked, whereas he was clad in leather and bone. She was unarmed, whereas he had a club. She was a wayfish, whereas he was huge. Despite him having the advantage, the resident was clearly terrified of her. The rules of hell dictated that he should have cracked her skull, taken her skin, and eaten her flesh, but that just wasn't happening. He was uncoordinated and apparently desperate to escape. Every swing he took was clumsy, and the blows he did manage to land on her didn't seem to have any effect. I could only stare at this naked, vulnerable woman that took the resident's club from his unresisted hand and swung it on his knee. I'm accustomed to the sound of bones breaking by now, but this time the noise caught me off guard. How the fuck was this happening? She brought the club down on the other knee, then his elbows, then his ankles, and then his shoulders. She left him broken and screaming on the floor. She could have finished him off with a blow to the head, stolen his clothes, and taken her rightful place as a resident. That's how hell works. These are the rules I've learned through bloody trial and error. That 
isn't what happened. Rather than kill him, she sat down beside him in the mud and took his hands in hers. I actually thought that she was going to console him. Instead, she started breaking his fingers, one by one. She snapped the fingers on both his hands with a calmness that made no sense to me. Torture is common in hell, but there's also a purpose behind it. The people in Skin Street do it out of sadism, and the people in the Boneyard do it for their insane purification rituals. This woman did it without emotion and without reason. I honestly don't know if she even understood that she was hurting him. I don't think her mind works the same way as ours. Eventually, the resident lost consciousness. A man can only take so much pain before the shock gets to him. Surely now she'd be satisfied, right? Surely she'd take his clothes and restore Hell's order. No. She stood up, tilted her head slightly, and uttered a noise for the first time. It wasn't a victory cry, nor was it even a sigh of relief. Instead, the sound that she made was nothing more than a faintly bemused. Mm. It was as if she couldn't comprehend why her plaything had stopped moving. She stood up and stepped away from him, apparently content to leave him alive. Unconscious and crippled on the ground, she kept his club but didn't take his clothing. The cold and the rain didn't seem to bother her. And then she looked at me. In that instant, I knew I was looking at the pale witch. I looked into her eyes and I couldn't fucking move. I understood what she was straight away and the sheer terror of it froze me. The pale witch isn't a striga. She isn't a gorgon and she isn't a succubus. The pale witch is a cambion. It's hard to put into words exactly how paralyzing the sight of a cambion is. That perfectly serene face and those dead, staring eyes just don't belong on a body that's otherwise human. It was like looking into the face of a mannequin and knowing that it's looking back at you. Hmm. That noise again. That kind of detached curiosity shouldn't exist in the world of predator and prey. Might makes right survival of the fittest. Nobody in the city of Dis has any right to make that noise. She took an awkward step towards me and I saw that her right leg was broken. It seemed that her fight with the resident had injured her after all. She just didn't notice. She tried to walk normally, completely unaware that one of her legs had an extra joint. I don't care how tough you are, Nobody should be able to put their full weight onto a broken leg without even wincing. Hmm. She stepped closer, her zombie shuffle steadily closing the gap between us as I stared at her. She raised her club and my survival instincts finally kicked into gear. Her transfixing spell broke just enough for me to stumble backwards and avoid her swing. And I ran. I ran from a woman with a broken leg, and I'm not even ashamed of it. Looking back at my experience, there are some things I just can't comprehend. The Pale Witch is a Cambion. I'm certain of it. She was born in Hell, and Hell is all she has ever known. She also looked to be about 30 years old. That just shouldn't be possible. No baby survives in Dis. Even if they had a tribe to protect them, there just isn't enough nourishment for an infant to grow into a toddler, let alone an adult. Pale Witch is a walking impossibility. Her existence is a defiance of all reason. I would endure every torture the people of Skin Street and the Boneyard could conceive of if it meant that I never ever had to look into her eyes again. <laughs>